Good afternoon, colleagues. The first item of business this afternoon is consideration of business motion 13613 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a timetable for the Stage 3 consideration of the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against this motion to press the request to speak button now, and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13613. Please, Minister. Formally moved. Many thanks. No members asked to speak against the motion, therefore I will now put the question to the Chamber. And the question is that motion number 13613, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is stage three proceedings on the Air Weapons Licensing and Licensing Scotland Bill. In dealing with amendments members should have, the Bill as amended at stage two, that is SP Bill 49A, the marshalled list, that is SP Bill 49 AML, the groupings, SP Bill 49 AG. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period then for the voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call that group. Members should now please refer to the marshalled list of amendments. I call Group 1, Air Weapons, Requirements for Grant or Renewal of an Air Weapons Certificate. And I call Amendment 1 in the name of Alex Ferguson, Group with Amendments 2, 3 and 4. And I point out that if Amendment 2 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 3 and 4 due to a preemption. Alex Ferguson, to please move Amendment 1 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, may I thank the Presiding Officers for allowing these amendments to be brought back at this stage. They were put forward at stage two, um, but we believe they are worthy of further consideration, and I'm grateful to the Presiding Officers for permitting that to happen. Presiding Officer, the purpose of amendments one and two is really quite simple. It is to save unnecessary bureaucracy, unnecessary expense, and unnecessary use of police officers' valuable time, surely three worthy aims. As we know, there are an estimated 500,000 air weapons in Scotland, and therefore, presumably, at least 300,000 people who own them, each and every one of whom will have to undergo a process of being approved for and obtaining an air weapon certificate. Now, that's a pretty monumental task in anybody's book, but when it's to be carried out by Police Scotland, who are currently in the process of reducing Scotland's specialist resource of civilian firearms officers from an already miserly 34 to the almost unbelievably no number of 14, one has to query whether that task is actually achievable. And even if it is, I have to question its necessity. The statistical data on recorded crimes and offences, when they were eventually published um, not that long ago, showed that air gun crime is at the second lowest level of the last decade, a 73% reduction from its peak. And therefore it does seem to me that if the purpose of this regime is to reduce air gun crime, and if you want to find the perfect example of taking a large sledgehammer to crack a fairly small nut, you need look no further than this proposal. And on top of that, I haven't spoken to a single person engaged in this debate or discussion who seriously believes that the licensing regime in itself is going to do anything to actually reduce air gun crime. Too many air guns will simply drop off the radar once this bill comes into force for that to be the case. And those that do drop off the radar, I would suggest, are unlikely to fall into the hands of people who are immediately going to rush to ensure that they've got the necessary permit to hold one. But the bill is clearly going to be passed today. I accept that entirely. So in order to reduce the bureaucracy and expense, expense and time involved, I would urge the government to accept amendments one and two. They would simply mean that existing and future holders of shotgun licenses and firearm certificates would not be required to undergo a further process in order to possess an air gun. If nothing else, this would reduce the number having to be processed by some 40,000 people. 
But more importantly, I think, if you are already deemed to be a fit and proper person to hold either and to own either a rifle or a shotgun, both infinitely more dangerous weapons than any air gun, then it is surely disproportionate beyond belief to require such a person to undergo yet another process and further expense in order to possess an air weapon as well. So my amendments would save time, money and precious police resources. If amendments one and two are unacceptable to the government, then I offer amendments three and four as a less satisfactory but nonetheless simpler compromise than the bill as it is published. What's not to like, presiding officer? I move amendment one in my name. Thank you very much. I have had no prior notification that members wish to contribute to any of the groups um, this afternoon. However, I accept that members may press the request to speak. That being the case, I will try to call them, but I must ask for brevity of contributions. Elaine Murray to be followed by Liam MacArthur. My apologies, presiding officer. I didn't realise that we had to notify in advance for speaking on amendments. Ms Murray, excuse me a moment. You don't have to notify yeah. in advance, but however, it does mean that if we run out of time, then I cannot call members because the timings are based on what we know. Um, can I say that the Countryside Alliance have contacted us about this and also I've had another cu a couple of constituents contacting me about their concerns uh, uh, in regard of people who already have a firearms li licence should, should be allowed to have uh, uh, an air guns, an air weapons licence. Can I say that I resist these amendments? Um, the fire regulation, firearms regulations differ from these, this bill, uh, but if somebody has one firearm, they do not automatically get allowed to have another firearm, another lethal weapon. So the fact that somebody has a, a, fire, a, a license for a firearm shouldn't necessarily allow them to automatically be entitled to have an air weapon, to have another lethal weapon, without actually showing that there is good reason for having a, a, an air weapon. And I, I therefore resist the idea that somehow because you've got a, a, a license for one firearm, you should be allowed to have any amount of air, air weapons without actually having to prove that you've got a good reason for having them. Um, the bill does provide for some factors to be exempt, and quite rightly so, uh, but I do b believe that the Chief Constable should be satisfied that there is a good reason for holding a lethal weapon, which is what an air gun is. The air guns of this size, of this power, are lethal weapons, and there should be, people should have a good reason for having one. I understand why farmers may feel that they're being, in particular, that they are tend to have a shotgun licence and therefore should be, be allowed to have an air weapons licence. But this isn't just about the farming community, this is about the whole community in Scotland. And I think that it is um, important that the bill stays as it is and is not amended. The second group of amendments, first of all, I think pretty must for me, actually I think may is normally the, the, the normal terminology in, in legislation anyway, but it's just another way of trying to do the same thing and I would resist all four amendments in Alex Ferguson's name. Many thanks. Lee MacArthur, briefly, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Obviously, the, the Minister will be aware of the concerns expressed by my uh, colleague, Tavish Scott, at Stage 1, in terms of the proportionality and, indeed, the effectiveness of the bill as it currently stands. Uh, I very much uh, welcome the fact that Alex Ferguson uh, has succeeded in bringing forward uh, these amendments. I think, from my own experience, uh, Police Scotland is, indeed, struggling to, uh, to cope with the workload pressures uh, already involved in terms of uh, administering uh, shotgun licences. I think uh, the provision, provisions put forward by Alex Ferguson at least offer some opportunity uh, to make the bill a bit more proportionate uh, and ease some of those workload pressures on Police Scotland and therefore I'm happy to lend them my support. Many thanks. Cabinet Secretary, please. Senator Officer, Mr Ferguson has tabled a group of amendments which would fundamentally change the way in which we and the police intend to approach the licensing of air weapons under this new legislation. The amendments reflect some of the objections we have heard to the principles of air weapons licensing. These objections were expressed by some of the shooting representatives on our expert consultative panel and by others who responded to our public consultation in early 2013. The committee heard similar views during the first evidence session on the bill in November last year and again at stage two when Mr Cameron, uh, brought, uh, lodged, uh, sorry, Mr. Cameron Buchanan uh, lodged these amendments. However, as I said at stage two, we believe that the measures and tests set out in part one of the bill achieve our aim of establishing a familiar, proportionate and practical licensing regime for air weapons. Amendment one and the consequential amendment two seek to provide an automatic exemption from the need for an air weapon certificate to any person who already holds a firearm certificate or shotgun certificate issued by the police under the Firearms Act 1968. We did look at this as a potential exemption from the licensing requirements when we first developed this legislation. 
However, we rejected this option for several reasons. Under the Firearms Act 1968, for example, the tests for the grant of a firearms or shotgun certificate are different. The test for granting shotgun certificates is less stringent. There is no fit and proper person test and the onus is on the police to demonstrate the absence of a good reason rather than the applicant having to show good reason. We do not think that this is a right approach to the licensing of firearms, including air weapons. Also, firearms, shotguns and air weapons are used for different purposes and in different circumstances, as was explained clearly by the police when they gave evidence to the committee at stage one. It does not necessarily follow that someone who has a legitimate reason for requiring a powerful rifle, for example, will also have a good reason for requiring an air weapon. This bill gives us the chance to set out proper provision to regulate air weapons in a modern Scotland. We believe that applicants should be required to demonstrate that they have a reasonable and proper use for these guns and that they can be entrusted to use them responsibly and safely. Amendment 3 and 4. Can I just finish the points I want to make first? Amendments 3 and 4 offer an alternative to the first two amendments in the group. They would require the Chief Constable to consider any applicant who holds a firearm or shotgun certificate to automatically meet the requirement to grant an air weapon certificate without any further inquiry. Again, we believe that accepting these amendments would undermine the fundamental principle behind the licensing regime and tests set out within it. Having said all of that, we have been clear that the new licensing regime should not place undue burdens on the police or applicants. That is why we have already made provision in Section 5.2 to allow the Chief Constable to take as satisfied the test that a person is fit to be entrusted with an air weapon and that they are not prohibited from possessing firearms under the Firearms 1968 Act if they already hold a firearms or shotgun certificate. We also make provision in Section 9 of the Bill to allow the alignment of air weapon certificates with those for firearms and shotguns. Coterminous certificates already exist to align firearms and shotgun licences. This addition of the air weapon will mean that all certificates fall to be renewed on the same date, reducing the burden on the applicant and also on the licensing authority. The fee for a coterminous air weapon certificate application will, as a result, be set at a lower level than that of a full application, as the police will be able to conduct all of their inquiries at the same time. Officer, I believe that these measures go a significant way towards the aim set out by Mr Ferguson's amendments, and without compromising our overall objective of setting an adequate and fair test for the granting of certificates. I'm happy to give way to Liam MacArthur. Liam MacArthur. I'm very grateful to the Minister. I've listened very carefully to the points he's made, and I think um, he has gone some way to addressing some of those concerns around burden. But um, clearly, Police Scotland are struggling at the moment to deal with the workload pressures they have in operating the gun uh, licensing uh, provisions. What he's set out, I don't believe, will, uh, will, will, will be satisfactory in terms of addressing concerns of the additional workload. So what reassurances can he give that Police Scotland is geared up to deal with the, the workload pressures that are clearly going to come as a result of this bill? Cabinet Secretary. Well, if the member considered the evidence that was actually given by Police Scotland to the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, they outlined the way in which gun certificates are actually dealt with, and there's a peak and a trough of them, and we are timing the introduction of the provision around air weapons licensing to fit into the period when there is that lower level of firearms and shotgun certificates requiring renewal. Police Scotland are confident that they can manage this as they move forward, including with the introduction of their new database that's dealing with all of this, to do it in a smooth and in a proportionate and reasonable way. And I'm confident, given the assurances that they have provided us with, that we can take that forward. And on that basis, I would encourage Parliament to reject amendments one to four that have been proposed by Mr Ferguson. Many thanks. Can I now invite Alex Ferguson to wind up and to indicate, please, if you intend to press or withdraw. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer, and um, I'm grateful to members for their contributions. I would say to Elaine Murray, this is not just about the farming community, though obviously they have, she and I and, and other members will have received representations from the farming community, but I don't think this is just about the farming community by any means. There are all sorts of people who I think will feel that this extra burden placed upon them is, un is, is as unnecessary as it is, I believe, still disproportionate. 
Um, I, I do think this is a disproportionate measure um, to, to be bringing in. The um, Cabinet Secretary understandably said that the applicant has to show good reason for possessing a shotgun rather than um, the other way around as currently exists in, in the firearms licensing regime. But at the end of the day, a decision still has to be taken by police officers or enforcement officers as to whether or not that good reason is good enough. So I, I still think there is a burden being placed on the police. I don't know if the Cabinet Secretary is aware, but I am reliably informed, and I'll be coming back to this later this afternoon, that there's already quite a heavy backlog of shotgun certificate and firearms license applications that Police Scotland are failing to keep up with at the moment. So, However much you, you try to bring the processes together, I cannot see that this new process is going to be anything other than a very, very heavy burden upon them, when I think most of us would believe that Police Scotland officers have better things to do. So uh, we've made the arguments. I accept we are where we are. But I am going to press this uh, amendment, presiding officer, and I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. The amendments have been pressed, and therefore the question is that amendment one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. As this is the first division of the stage, then the Parliament is suspended for five minutes. Thereafter, there will be a 30-second division.
the division on amendment one. This is a 30-second division. Could members please cast their votes now? Order. The result of the vote on amendment number one is yes, 19, no, 96. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment two in the name of Alex Ferguson already debated with amendment one. And I remind members that if amendment two is agreed to, then I cannot call amendments three and four due to preemption. And I ask Alex Ferguson to move or not to move. Not to move, presiding officer. Not moved. I now call Amendment 3 in the name of Alex Ferguson, already debated with Amendment 1, and I ask Alex Ferguson to move or not to move. Moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you. The question then is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. This is a 30-second division. Please vote now. Order, please. The result of the vote on amendment number three is yes, 19, no, 98. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment four in the name of Alex Ferguson, already debated with amendment one, and I ask Alex Ferguson to move or not to move. Moved, presiding officer. The question then is that amendment four be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a 30 second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number four is yes, 19, no, 100. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. That then brings us to group two, alcohol licensing, licensing objectives. And I call amendment five in the name of Patrick Harvey, group with amendments six and seven. And I invite Patrick Harvey to move amendment five and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I was prompted to introduce these amendments following the recent decision in relation to the Arches venue in Glasgow. Members will be aware of the press coverage of the decision by the Glasgow Licensing Board to revoke the Arches' uh, ability to operate past midnight, effectively closing it as a club venue with the consequent uh, uh, eventuality that the jobs have been lost, but also the cultural value uh, of that venue has been lost to Glasgow and to Scotland. Members, I'm sure, will be aware of the nearly 40,000 members of the public who signed a petition calling for that licensing board decision Order, to be reversed. Order, please. Could we hear the member? Members will be aware of the 40,000 or so, uh, not at the moment, thank you, the 40,000 or so uh, members of the public who called for that decision to be reversed, and also the open letter signed by more than 400 leading names in Scotland, not at the moment, thank you. 
nearly 400 uh, members of the, the, the arts community in Glasgow. They said, our main concern is that we are not satisfied that full consideration has been given to the potentially catastrophic impact this decision will have on the cultural life of Scotland. They went on to look at the social as well as cultural benefit of the, of the venue. Thousands of people from all over the country come together at the Arties at weekends and it is widely regarded by leading professionals as one of the best venues in the world. Later on, they say, a key venue at the centre of Glasgow's remarkable cultural renaissance of the past 25 years, the artist's importance to the future of the cultural life of Scotland cannot be overstated. Having discussed this situation with colleagues who serve on licensing boards, I think there are two issues which my amendments are intended to address. First of all, that the existing licence objectives focus on the harm that can be done in terms of crime and disorder, public safety, nuisance, uh, impact on public health and protecting children from harm. These are important factors and licensing boards should take them into account. But there are positive factors as well which can come from licensing venues, from the cultural and social benefit that venues give to a community. Those factors should be taken into account. My first uh, amendment in this group introduces an additional licensing objective of promoting social and cultural life. The, the, the second... Uh, yeah, OK. John Mason. To the member for giving way. I, mean, I just wonder if he's arguing that a venue which is uh, causing problems uh, should be closed if it's a standalone venue, but a venue causing problems should be allowed to stay open if it's linked to an arts venue. Patrick Harvey. I'm arguing that our approach to licensing should take a holistic look at all of the impacts of a decision, not only at some of the impacts of a decision. The second two amendments in this group address a second concern that discussions with colleagues on licensing boards uh, threw up, that they often feel drawn to make a decision purely about one venue in particular rather than about the wider impact. And in this instance, we look at the harm that's come from recreational drugs. Most people who went to the arches to go out clubbing use recreational drugs. For most of them, that was a licensed, legal recreational drug, alcohol, and most of us use it as well. Recreational drugs pose a risk of harm, and we should be taking that seriously. But the idea that by closing a venue like the arches, which has a long-standing record of being one of the most progressive, enlightened and responsible venues in relation to illegal drugs, reporting issues to the police, making sure there are medical facilities on site when someone gets into trouble, training their staff well. The idea that by closing this venue, people who use illegal recreational drugs when they will go out clubbing will instead go to the library or to a poetry reading is nonsense. What this will do is mean that people use the same drugs in less responsible, less experienced venues. Let's not kid ourselves that there aren't already many clubs, not just in Glasgow but elsewhere as well, who if they find drugs on the premises will not report it to the police but will flush them. Let's not pretend that there are not irresponsible venues out there. By, by taking this approach to licensing, we risk increasing the incentive for that irresponsible type of behaviour. So these second two amendments in this group ask purely that we balance the, the decision about an individual premises with the wider impact on the community. Uh, and these two amendments, I hope, would take a different approach. If there's time, I'll give way to Sandra White. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, I hear exactly what Patrick Harvey is saying, but to be precise, we're talking about one venue, but operating in two different ways. So what you're basically saying, similar to what John Mason has said, surely it would have been better to, basically, you've got the Archie's nightclub, which they say the money's there, pays for the cultural part of it, and obviously we're sorry about anyone losing jobs, but surely the best way forward would have been to give monies to the cultural part rather than what you're saying just now in regards to if a venue is uh, safe to use drugs, then that's all right as a cultural and social venue. What about all the other social venues who don't participate in what you're saying just now? Patrick Harvey. The, the argument for additional arts funding to try and salvage some of the Arches business model is still on the table. But the case I'm making with Amendments five and six, uh, 6 and 7 in this group are not the same as Amendment 5. Amendment 5 is about cultural and social life as a licensing objective. 
But in amendments, uh, the second two amendments in this group, I would make the same case with a purely commercial club venue which had no artistic element as part of its business model. If you have a responsible venue which behaves well, which trains its staff, which provides medical facilities, do we really think we're improving public safety by closing down a venue like that and ins ensuring that its customers will go elsewhere to a less experienced or less responsible venue. I don't think this is an appropriate way to leave the, the alcohol licensing regime mopping up the harm that is done by irrational drug laws in this country. And I move Amendment 5 in my name, Presiding Officer. Many thanks, Mr Harvey. Despite the fact that the Parliament agreed a timetabling motion, it is now clear from the number of members that are requesting to speak that the agreed time will not be sufficient. Therefore, under Rule 9.8.5a, I am minded to accept a motion without notice to propose that the time limit be extended by 15 minutes. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The question is that the time limit by which the debates on groups 1 to 3 uh, the, the, the question is that the time limit by which the debate on groups 1 to 3 must end be extended by 15 minutes. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. That will in turn extend the time limit for subsequent groups. Can I also notify the Chamber that the clock in the Chamber was reset in error? The time used in debate on amendments began at 2.32pm. The timetable for consideration of amendments will be taken, therefore, from that time. I now call Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. I do appreciate the concerns that the member is raising and recognise it's about the regrettable closure of the arches in Glasgow. I think there is a discussion to be had about how licensing board operates, the proportionate policing of Glasgow's club scene and also the responsibility of licensed premises to meet public safety demands. Uh, we've not had much time to consider these amendments, but I'm not convinced that this piece of legislation is the way to deal with these issues. However, we may need to have this debate at another time, but it shouldn't be rushed and it would need to include full consultation with all interested parties. Thank you. I call Sandra White to be followed by Cameron Buchanan. Um, thank you very much, President Officer. <clears throat> One of the issues that uh, I do raise is the definition of social and cultural life. And I understand regarding the arches, and I have explained before, about the cultural part of the arches. But I have real concerns in regards to this amendment in the definition of social and cultural life. How do you define that? And I know exactly what Patrick Harvey is saying about the arches, but the other forms of cultural life. Will this bring into you know, cultural and social life strip clubs or sexual entertainment premises? And I have a real worry that this actually would go against everything, obviously, that some of the amendments I put forward in this bill. So like Claire Baker, yeah, perhaps we should be looking at it, a further definition and a further debate on it, but I don't think at the least late stage to use this as a proper channel to go through. Brief contributions, please. Cameron Buchanan to be followed by Ken McIntosh. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Regarding Amendment 5, I could understand the desire to promote social, sensible activities, but does ha Patrick Harvey not consider that the aim of promoting social and cultural life is already achieved by adhering to the existing licensing objectives on the public's behalf? I think it is worth remembering that licensing objectives are intended to protect the public, and this should remain their core purpose. I also appreciate the principles behind Amendments 6 and 7, but have concerns about their implementation. The objectives are meant to protect the public from particular problems, and licensing decisions should respond to these when necessary. The key phrase, I think, is where necessary. Local issues should be responded to locally. Could Patrick Harvey therefore confirm whether the intention of these amendments is to clarify the Board's responsibility for its whole area, or rather to encourage restrictions to be applied across the whole board area, even when many parts of it will not have pressing licensing issues. And as somebody has said, I think I'm hard, it is hard not to be sympathetic with Mr Harvey's amendment, but I don't think this is either the time or the place to debate them. Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I also want to express uh, my sympathy for the motivation of Patrick Harvey for bringing the amendments today. I know it's an issue. The future of the arches is one that's been raised by colleagues on our benches, including Drew Smith, uh, and Claire Baker. Um, however, there are two arguments I would uh, put to uh, Mr Harvey. One is that changing the legislation governing licensing to introduce a whole new objective of promoting social and cultural life is a fairly significant development and one at the very least deserves fuller consideration. And the second point, a related one, is that it's not generally good practice to introduce new proposals such as this at stage three. Civic licensing is already a very complicated area. The Civic uh, Government Scotland Act has been amended many, many times. So I would urge Mr Harvey, having made his point, to withdraw this amendment. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. 
Sign officer, I'm grateful to Patrick Harvey for taking us through his amendments. The licensing objectives represent the value in which the Scottish alcohol licensing system is based, and they are central to the way in which, we lic in which licensing boards carry out their functions under the 2005 Act. The current licensing objectives contained within the 2005 Act are preventing crime and disorder, securing public safety, preventing public nuisance, protecting and improving public health, and lastly, protecting children from harm, which by virtue of Section 41 of this Bill will soon include protecting young persons too. Mr Harvey's proposed objective to promote social and cultural life sits very uneasily within an Act whose purpose is for the regulation of the sale of alcohol. It is difficult to see how it could operate in practice for licensing boards, the trade and the public. I am concerned that, while laudable, we should not be charging licensing boards with the promotion of social and cultural life. The existing licensing objectives concern themselves with mitigating the ill effects of alcohol. However, the proposed new objective does not have that same concern as its primary aim. I am sure that we all expect boards to take decisive action to address alcohol misuse. This amendment has a potential to create difficulties for licensing boards to dis on deciding which of the objectives should be deemed more important than the other when considering an individual case and deterring them from taking the sorts of decisions that we would expect them to take. Officer, I do not believe that the legislation concerning the regulation of the sale of alcohol is the appropriate means by which to consider the promotion of social and cultural life in Scotland. In addition to that, I am of the view that the promotion of social and cultural life in Scotland is also not dependent upon the sale and the consumption of alcohol. As such, I do not believe that this should become one of the licensing objectives in the 2005 Act. And I would therefore ask Mr Harvey to withdraw these amendments, which, if passed, would undermine the entire alcohol licensing regime and all that it sets out to achieve. Many thanks. Can I now invite Patrick Harvey to wind up and indicate, please, if you intend to press or withdraw. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I think in relation to the, the, one of the final comments there, the idea that this undermines everything that the licensing regime sets out to achieve, I, th I think that's a wee bit uh, of hyperbole there. This amendment is intended, that, that Amendment 5 in any, in any regard, is intended to broaden uh, what we seek to achieve with the licensing regime. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary says uh, that the regulation of the sale of alcohol is not the place for the promotion of cultural life in Scotland. Well, if that's the case, it's certainly not the place either for the uh, promotion of the objectives of uh, our country's drug laws. Whether you support or oppose uh, our current drug laws, the fact is that the, uh, the impact of uh, incidents of illegal drug use was a critical issue which led to the licensing board's decision. Uh, and I, I, I once again cannot accept the argument that moving recreational drug use from one venue to another increases public safety. Certainly not if we're moving it from a responsible, well-trained venue to others which are less so. I give way to Mr Smith. Drew Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful uh, to Mr Harvey, but wasn't uh, one of the concerns that the Licensing Board uh, had to deal with in the specific case of the Archies was concern from the police. So how would uh, the amendments that he proposes um, lead to a situation where the Licensing Board would be in a position to disregard those police concerns that, that were actually at the root uh, of the decision they had to take around the Archies? Patrick Harvey. I, I wouldn't want any licensing board in Scotland to disregard the concerns of the police, but I, I would want uh, what one member called proportionate policing. I think it was Claire Baker used the phrase proportionate policing. Is it really proportionate? Is it even intelligent to send out a signal to other club venues in Glasgow or elsewhere that if they report incidents to the police instead of covering them up, they will be putting their licence at risk. That's what we will risk doing at the moment, is sending out a signal that irresponsible behaviour is less likely to lead to a, a licence being put uh, at risk. The, there are several members who have pointed out that this amendment is coming late, and I admit that. 
I freely admit that. Uh, and, and some members will feel uh, that it's uh, too big a change to, to move at stage three. This was a response that I felt was necessary to recent events uh, and to challenge the idea that we only focus on the harm we would be quite wrong to ignore the harm that is done uh, with, with licensing uh, of the sale of alcohol, but we are also wrong to, acknowledge, uh, to, wrong to fail to acknowledge the good that is done from licensing responsible, uh, well-trained venues and supporting them to operate even when there are problems, because those problems may be better dealt with on those premises than on others. I, I will press Amendment 5, but whether members vote for it or not, I really think that we have an issue here that requires further debate. Uh, and a, a recognition that we've been shying away from some problems uh, and pretending that our current approach to licensing solves them when it manifestly doesn't. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not. There will be a division. This will be a one-minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number five is as follows, yes, nine, no, 109, there were no abstentions, the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment six in the name of Patrick Harvey, already debated with amendment five, and I ask Patrick Harvey to move or not move. Moved. The question then is that amendment six be agreed to, are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed, there will be a division, 32nd division, please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number six is yes, nine, no, 109. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment seven in the name of Patrick Harvey, already debated with amendment five, and I ask Patrick Harvey to move or not move. Moved. The question then is that amendment seven be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not. There will therefore be a 30 second division. Please vote now. Amendment number seven is yes, nine, no, 109. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. That brings us to group three, alcohol licensing over provision under call amendment eight in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Group with amendments nine, 10 and 11. And I ask the Cabinet Secretary to move amendment eight, please, and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, President officer, I move the amendment in my name. Uh, the amendments in this group are minor technical amendments concerning over provision. Uh, section 7 of the 2005 Act places a duty on licensing boards to make an assessment of over provision of licensed premises in any locality within their area 
and to subsequently include a statement regarding this in their licensing policy objective statement. Uh, this allows boards to consider the unique circumstances of their area, including distinct localities within it, and deciding whether, based on local need, it is appropriate to restrict access to alcohol through limits on new licences, licences of a particular type, or variations of existing licences within the entire area or identified part of it. It is important that the overprovision assessment is an effective and robust tool for licensing boards. In respect of the overprovision grounds for refusal for a premises licence or for a major variation of a premises licence, our amendment to the Bill at Stage 2 had made the wording of the 2005 Act more concise. These technical amendments have been brought forward at Stage 3, responding to concerns raised by stakeholders that our Stage 2 amendment had in reality made the wording overly brief. On following consideration, we agreed that more detail at Section 23.5e of the 2005 Act, Refusal of Premises Licence on Grounds of Overprovision, and Section 35d of the 2005 Act, Refusal to Vary Premises Licence on the Grounds of Overprovision, will clarify interpretation. That is why we have brought forward these technical amendments to rectify this so that the updated section 23.5e and 35d of the 2005 Act are clearer to the reader of the legislation. And I would ask Parliament to support these amendments. Thank you. I have no further requests to speak. Cabinet Secretary, do you need to wind up on this? No. Question then is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call amendments 9, 10 and 11, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 9 to 11 on block. Moved. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 9 to 11? Since no member objects, the question then is that amendments 9 to 11 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. That then brings us to Group 4, Alcohol Licensing Annual Functions Report, and I call Amendment 12 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary Group with Amendment 13, and ask the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 12 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Mr. Officer, I move Amendment 12. I gave a commitment to the Local Government and Regeneration Committee at Stage 2 to bring forward this amendment that will impose a new duty on licensing boards to prepare and publish an annual report on the exercising of their functions. This amendment addresses a concern first raised by Alcohol Focus Scotland and others and supported by the Local Government and Regeneration Committee about the need for licensing boards to provide greater clarity about how they carry out their business. John Wilson brought forward a non-government amendment at Stage 2 eh, to oblige licensing boards to lodge annual reports on the exercise of their function. Uh, the, the Government is sympathetic to the views expressed during the uh, Bill process, and I am grateful to John Wilson for agreeing to withdraw his own amendment at Stage 2 to allow my officials to carry out some informal stakeholder engagement before bringing forward this Government amendment. Section 55 of the Bill already imposes a duty on licensing boards to produce an annual financial report. This additional amendment imposes a further duty on boards to prepare and publish an annual report on the exercise of their functions no later than three months after the end of each financial year. The amendment set out uh, what generally should be included in the report and what boards should have regard to in its compilation. It also allows licensing boards to publish a combined financial and functions report if they so wish. To ensure that the reports remain as effective and useful as possible, this amendment also provides Scottish Ministers with the power to make further provision about the annual reports using secondary legislation. We would expect to consult on the most effective and proportionate format and content before laying secondary legislation is required. These annual reports will ensure increased accountability and transparency from licensing boards so that the public can see how they go about their business. And I would ask Parliament to support these amendments uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Brief contribution, John Wilson. And thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking on board uh, the amendments I put forward in my name based on discussions with Alcohol Focus Scotland. 
and welcome the decision by the Cabinet Secretary to bring forward these amendments today. And I look forward to the amendments being passed. Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to wind up? Thank you. In which case, the question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. I call Amendment 13 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 12 and I ask the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. That then brings us to Group 5, Alcohol Licensing, Register of Alcohol Premises, Licenses and Personal Licenses. And I call Amendment 14 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson in a group on its own and I ask Dr Richard Simpson to move and speak to Amendment 14, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I was not a member of this committee, but I observed their inf the information at stage one and the uh, evidence that was given by a number of people in respect of information that's available to the public. This amendment will create a national alcohol licensing register, ensuring that communities will have access to comprehensive information on licensing license premises, which will help their participation in the licensing process, particularly in relation to over-provision. Ensuring that data at a licensing board level is collect, collated in a uniform manner and then published uh, centrally, uh, preferably with access on a ward or small data basis, could ensure a much more accessible uh, form of information to local communities. While licensing boards currently have to keep a public licensing register, Alcohol Focus Scotland was recently able to locate only 16 such publicly available registers, covering 19 of the 40 licensing board areas. The form and content of the information provided within these registers is highly variable and not all the registers are available electronically. Alcohol licensing registers are potentially valuable tool for communities and other stakeholders to make use of in order to support their involvement in the licensing process, but there is a need to consider the form in which they are produced to ensure they are accessible and as helpful as possible. Currently, there is a national register for tobacco outlets in Scotland, which is available online and can be searched by local authority area, by postcode and by type of premises. Mapping tools such as that produced by the Lambeth Council or the new website showing alcohol and tobacco outlet density for small neighbourhood areas across Scotland, created in partnership between the Centre for Research on Environment, Society and Health, CRESH, at the University of uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow University, Alcohol for Scotland and Ash Scotland offer other examples of possible approaches. The evidence given by Dr Neve Short from Crash at Stage 1 said that one of the most striking things in documentation the, uh, the committee set out was the very small number of applications that were refused. Only 21 licences were refused, whereas 347 were granted in 2011-12. 12 were refused and 332 were granted in 2012-13. I think this in part shows the difficulties for local authorities in looking at licensing and fulfilling licensing objectives. Uh, the, 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 the data available is not available at a small local level. The data was available in such variable form that it took Crash nine months to clear and cleanse the data before they could put it into a research paper. And their paper, which has now been published and members may wish to look at, does show the relationship between uh, the density of license, the over-provision indeed, and uh, the uh, problem, alcohol problems in, in different areas. It is a huge disappointment that communities have been unable to challenge over-provision, uh, largely because they've been unable to actually get access to data. Total board area data and small area data is vital. And my men will allow the minister to make provision for a national register completed by the boards, this will not overburden licensees, but will require uh, the, the boards to produce information in a specific form, publishable on the web. 143A will ensure that the information to be recorded will not only include the number of personal licenses, but could include the, actual, the data on the uh, sales areas, uh, the linear sales areas for off-licenses, and the number of drinking places available and on-licenses. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. John Scott. Um, thank you. I will be brief. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's uh, addressing the problem faced by individual licence holders in this group and uh, the, who failed to renew their licences on time. I understand that this section of the bill will be enacted swiftly and I'd be grateful if he, the Cabinet Secretary, could publicise now and indeed widely thereafter this welcome change. 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, I am um, grateful to uh, Richard Simpson for bringing forward this uh, amendment, and I am sympathetic to the views which he has expressed. I am, however, concerned that this is not an issue uh, that I believe that it is appropriate to introduce at this stage in the Bill. This is not an issue that is being brought before the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, nor has it been subject to detailed financial consideration. For example, I understand that a similar service in relation to e-planning uh, has cost several millions of pounds to set up. I am also concerned that the amendment as lodged is unworkable, as it incorrectly places a burden on licensing authorities to provide information when, in fact, information required is held by licensing boards. I would, however, like to assure the Chamber that the Scottish Government is alert to these issues and there is already work in hand to go some way to addressing them. You will be aware that uh, Government Amendment 12, uh, which, has been, which was being pressed for uh, by public health bodies such as Alcohol Focus Scotland, will impose a duty on licensing boards to report on the exercise of their functions and provide considerable information on the licences held, including occasional licences. We intend to consult widely to ensure that these reports are as useful as they can be without imposing an undue burden on licensing boards. Furthermore, Police Scotland are already well advanced in rolling out their National Innkeeper database. As the police are a statutory consultee, this means that licensing boards will be provided with information from this national database. Finally, the Scottish Government is already working with a wide range of partner organisations to develop a business case in relation to a national online licensing solution. Initial work has led to a wider scope uh, being developed, looking beyond just alcohol licensing to cover the civic regime and beyond, including central government licensing regimes. I am sure all members are aware that the Scottish Government resources are limited, so I do not believe that it is entirely right that rather than hastily commit to a specific project, it is instead better that a major project like this is subject to proper scoping and cost-benefit analysis. That would allow us to assess the widest possible benefits to stakeholders, whilst also effectively using the resources that the Scottish Government, local authority and others have in this area. I therefore ask uh, Richard Simpson to withdraw his amendment on the basis that the Scottish Government has already has work underway in order to develop an action plan for the delivery of a national licensing solution. Thank you. And I invite Dr Richard Simpson to wind up and indicate yes. if you intend to press or withdraw. Uh, just very briefly, uh, uh, Presiding Officer, um, I am prepared to withdraw my amendment. I, th I think that under section 12.6 it will be possible for the Minister to actually ensure that the form and required contents of reports under the annual functions report amendment, which we have just passed, would allow him to do much of what I am asking for. Uh, and as I understand his intervention, that, that will be the case. It is essential that if small communities are going to participate fully in actually seeking to prevent over-provision, that they do have that information. So I would urge him to pursue the, uh, uh, the uh, development work, which he's already referred to, as rapidly as possible, and to ensure then that we do have an electronic system which does allow proper access. And on the basis of his reassurances, I will withdraw my amendment. Thank you very much. Dr Simpson seeks to withdraw Amendment 14. Does any member object? No member objects, therefore amendment 14 is withdrawn. That then brings us to group 6, private hire cars over provision. And I call amendment 15 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, grouped with amendment 16. And I invite Cameron Buchanan to move amendment 15 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Thank you, presiding officer. These amendments would make it clear that a licensing authority must prove that there is or would be overprovision if they wish to refuse a private car hire license application solely on the grounds of overprovision. I consider strongly that refusing a private hire car license, car license solely on the grounds of overprovision is anti-competitive and would hurt consumers, jobs and indeed the local economy. In the interest of compromise, I've worded this approach to ensure that, each re that such refusals are kept in cases where overprovision is certain. Refusals, refusals due to overprovision would be against the public's best interests for four reasons. Firstly, restricting the supply of private hire vehicles would limit the ability of consumers to choose between different services and select their preferred option. 
This choice is crucial to increasing and maintaining standards of service in the industry. Secondly, preventing new entrants would prevent prices from going as low as they could in a less restricted market, since expanded supply of private hire vehicles would bring down prices and make private transport more afford a more affordable option for all the consumers. Thirdly, experience elsewhere has shown that these lower prices would allow more people than before to make frequent use of pri private transport. This can be a great convenience and it would be a loss to the Scottish public if they were denied the same opening up of travel options as in other places. Finally, is it apparent that determining that a locality is overprovided would prevent economic growth and job creation? If someone wishes to start work as a private hired vehicle driver, a licensing authority shouldn't stand in the way of this just because other drivers have already entered the market and do not want competition for fares. For this reason, the amendments aim to provide some measure of protection against unfair licensing refusals by ensuring that authorities can only refuse licenses solely on the grounds of overprovision where it is certain. I therefore move Amendment 15. Thank you. I call Ken McIntosh. Thank you, President Officer. It was clear from Mr Buchanan's comments that he, he clearly believes that a competitive free market trumps every other consideration before this Parliament. Uh, I would urge colleagues to resist the amendments before us. Uh, he, he suggests that we want to replace a licensing authority's judgment that they are satisfied about overprovision uh, with proof that there is overprovision. The point is this was debated by the committee at stage two. At that stage, I think Mr Buchanan asked them to remove the amendment altogether. The Scottish Government agreed to commission further guidance. That was accepted by the committee, and I would ask Mr Buchanan to accept the committee's judgment on this matter. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. So, an officer, I'm grateful to Cameron Buchanan for explaining uh, this amendment. Uh, section 60 of the bill would allow a licensing authority to refuse a private hire car licence where they are satisfied that it would result in there being an overprovision of private hire cars. I remain of the view that an optional overprovision test in relation to private hire cars is a useful addition to the taxi and private hire car licensing regime. There are already appropriate checks and balances in place for those unhappy with the decision that a licensing authority has made. Paragraph 18 of Schedule 1 of the Civic Government Scotland Act 1982 provides that where a private hire car driver licence is refused, the applicant can require the licensing authority to provide reasons for that refusal and can appeal the decision to a sheriff court. If during any appeal hearing the licensing authority is unable to demonstrate that they have reasonably reached their decision, the sheriff can uphold the appeal and remit the case back to the authority to reconsider or reverse the original decision of the licensing authority. I am concerned that this amendment would create uncertainty in the mind of licensing authorities and deter them from considering an overprovision test in relation to private hire cars. I think it would be wrong to take away or discourage use of this potential tool from licensing authorities. An overprovision test would allow licensing authorities to ensure that those entering the private hire car trade can have ex the expectation of making a reasonable income and reduce the temptation for private hire car drivers to attempt to operate in illegal competition with taxis. And I would therefore ask Cameron Buchanan to withdraw Amendment 15 and 16. Thank you. Can I now invite Cameron Buchanan to wind up and indicate if you intend to press or withdraw, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I have listened to the arguments on both sides, and I actually would like to please press my amendment. Many thanks. The question then is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not. There will be a division. This is a one-minute division. Please vote now.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 15 is yes, 14, no, 102. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call Amendment 16 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 15, and to ask Cameron Buchanan to move or not to move. Not moved. Thank you. The member has not moved, in which case we turn to Group 7, testing of private hire car drivers. And I call Amendment 17 in the name of Cameron Buchanan in a group on its own. And I ask Cameron Buchanan to move and speak to Amendment 17, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This amendment would prevent licensing authorities from requiring testing of the navigational knowledge of applicants for a private hire car driver licence, but would allow other forms of background checks or testing. Satellite navigation now allows drivers to efficiently navigate without extensive knowledge of roads, which make requiring a knowledge test an unnecessary barrier to employment and growth in the industry. Furthermore, restricted competition would act against the interest of consumers. I think by please. Keeping... We need to hear the member. Furthermore, restricted competition would act against the interests of consumers by keeping prices higher than they should be. Some people may prefer the possibility to pay a little extra to be driven by someone with extensive local knowledge who doesn't need to use the satellite navigation system. But these people are free to choose a taxi instead of private hire vehicle. The point is that passengers should be free to choose for themselves which type of private transport to opt for, and the government shouldn't allow that choice to be taken away from them. We should allow the market to reflect customers' preferences by letting them make their own decisions rather than allow licensing authorities to dictate what sort of tax, tax industry there should be. I recall that the Minister argued at Stage 2 that the testing provisions should provide licensing authorities with discretion and tests could cover issues such as customer care, disability and disability awareness so that private services can meet the needs of customers. I do recognise these points and expect that he would welcome the amendment seven, that Amendment 17 retains that discretion and would allow such tests to take place, including checks to allay any fears of criminal backgrounds, which I think is very important. The point is that allowing knowledge testing of all drivers is, a dis, is distinct, as it would primarily be a method of shielding incumbents from the competitive effects of a technological change. Customers' preferences for knowledge or technology should be left to the customers to decide, and testing should only be introduced where it is in the consumer's best interests. I believe that this amendment strikes the appropriate balance and would therefore urge members to act on behalf of consumers by supporting Amendment 17. I therefore I move Amendment 17. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, I'm grateful to Cameron Buchanan for explaining Amendment 17. I'm mindful of the concerns that Cameron Buchanan has uh, raised uh, that creating too high a barrier to entry to the private hire car trade is not desirable. That is why the ability to test private hire car drivers has deliberately been drafted in a flexible manner. It is at the discretion of the local licensing authority to determine whether to test and what to test. We are also happy to make that point uh, that any test should be proportionate and necessary within the guidance that accompanies the legislation. Accordingly, where the local authority it does, see, it does not see that there is any requirement for a knowledge test uh, of any style to be taken forward for private hire car drivers, then they are not required to do so. However, I suspect that many passengers would quite rightly expect that a private hire car driver had a reasonable knowledge of the area and how to get about it. And it's right to give local licensing authorities the ability to test this. I remain of the view that it is the licensing authority that is best placed to decide if any test concerning private hire car drivers should occur and what that test should involve. And I would therefore ask Cameron Buchanan to withdraw his amendment. Thank you. Can I invite Cameron Buchanan to wind up and indicate if you intend to press or withdraw, please? Thank you, Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I do sense some sympathy from my point of view, but I, in view of this, I would still like to press my amendment, please. Thank you. The question then is, Amendment 17 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. This is a one-minute division. Please vote now.
Audrey, please. The result of the vote on amendment number 17 is yes, 14, no, 100. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. That then brings us to Group 8, Notice of Sexual Entertainment Venue Licence Application. And I call Amendment 18 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and the Group on its own, and I ask the Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 18, please. Signed officer, Amendment 18 is an important measure in supporting community engagement in the licensing of sexual entertainment. Uh, this is an issue that was raised by Cara Hilton at Stage 2, and I undertook at uh, that time to bring forward an amendment at Stage 3. Whilst the current process already allows for robust notification procedures with requirement for both newspaper advertising and notices to be publicly displayed, I think that there are advantages in requiring specific notification to particular bodies who will have an interest in the licensing of sexual entertainment venues. There is a practical advantage in ensuring that uh, important stakeholders such as violence against women partnerships and community councils are notified of applications early on so that they have sufficient time to consider applications and make such representations to the authority as they consider appropriate. This is also an advantage in that it will send a very clear message that those groups which are identified as appropriate Order, please. to can we hear the cabinet secretary thank you which are appropriate to receive copies of the application like uh, perhaps violence against women partnerships and community groups are at the heart of this licensing process rather than identify particular bodies in primary legislation my preference is for each local authority to identify which organisations within their area should be notified of these applications as they are best placed to make that judgment. However, the statutory guidance that will follow the bill will indicate the types of bodies and organisations that should be considered. And my intention is that this will certainly include bodies such as Violence Against Women Partnerships and, local, and the local authorities will have to take that guidance into consideration when compiling their list of recipients. Local authorities will also have to have regard to their sexual entertainment venues licensing policy statement and the full range of objectives set out in that document. And I move Amendment 18. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I have no other requests to speak. Do you wish to add anything further? In which case, the question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. That brings us to Group 9, Sexual Entertainment Venues, Access of Persons Under 18. And I call Amendment 22 in the name of Cara Hilton, Group with Amendment 19. I point out that if Amendment 22 is agreed to, then I cannot call Amendment 19 as there is a preemption. And I ask Cara Hilton to move Amendment 22 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by thanking Zero Tolerance Trust for working with me on this amendment and the Scottish Commissioner for Children and Young People who has given this amendment its support. The purpose of this amendment is to prevent under-18s from working in sexual entertainment venues. My amendment removes the option of young people being employed in these venues at any time and will ensure that sexual entertainment venues cannot be accessed by children and young people at any time. While I recognise that Amendment 19 in the name of Michael Matheson does seek to clarify the circumstances in which young people may enter inter sexual entertainment venues and obliges operators to provide a reasonable excuse. I do not accept that this provides sufficient safeguards. When I tabled this same amendment at stage two, there was some debate about the employment rights, for example, of an, an apprentice plumber attending a job at a sexual entertainment venue. But the reality is this affects very few young people. But there are significant risks to a large number of young people if the bill proceeds as it is currently drafted. Zero Tolerance Trust have argued that allowing under-18s to be employed in sexual entertainment venues in essence creates a groomer's charter, allowing venues to employ teenage girls to work as cleaners or in office roles and then to persuade or subtly coerce them to become performers when they reach 18. I think this is a real concern for vulnerable young women such as care leavers or women living with poverty or disadvantage. Even if sexual ent entertainment is not taking place, a young person working in one of these venues will be exposed to sexually explicit materials and could be at risk of sexual exploitation, being propositioned for sex and being exposed to an, an industry which damages women to an environment in which sexual entertainment is normalised, leading a vulnerable young person to come to the view that sexual entertainment is an acceptable form of employment for them. The Children's Commissioner, Tam Bailey, has said the approach being taken in this bill towards young people being employed in sexual entertainment venues appears in direct contradiction 
to a range of key Scottish Government policies and legislation, including getting it right for every child and the Children and Young People's Act. I think if we're serious about an equal Scotland and if we're serious about tackling domestic abuse and violence, if we really want to make Scotland a best place, the best place to grow up for girls, then the Scottish Government has got to be consistent. Michael Matheson's amendment, while well-intentioned, has, to quote Sam Bailey again, the potential to create more difficulties than it solves. The use of the word reasonable leaves it way open to wider interpretation. I think this could be the, to the detriment of young people and will put more young people at risk. It is already the case that no under 18 year old can work in a sex shop under any circumstance and I think this provision should apply, uh, apply to these venues too. My amendment would allow this to happen. I believe my amendment is in the best interests of children and young people right across Scotland. I would urge the Scottish Government and members to listen to the views of the Scottish Commissioner for Children and Young People, the views of groups such as Bernardo Scotland, Zero Tolerance, Trust Rape Crisis Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid. Support my amendment. I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. I now call the Cabinet Secretary. No, I now call Cameron McCannan to speak. To... No, I beg your pardon. I will call the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 19 and other amendments in the group first, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I am happy to speak to Amendment 19 and 22. Uh, they both follow the issues which have been highlighted uh, by the Children's Commissioner ahead of the Stage 1 debate and subsequently pursued by Zero Tolerance Scotland. Uh, each concerns the position of young people in relation to sexual entertainment venues and a particular and a particular uh, concern that a young person uh, could be employed in such a venue, for example, as a cleaner, and then find themselves being drawn into becoming a dancer. I, uh, at stage two, I agreed to consider this matter further and bring forward an appropriate government amendment at stage three. We have always uh, made clear that the intention of the bill is to tighten up licensing of sexual entertainment ven venues, which hitherto have been treated in more or less the same way as any other licensed premise. That has meant that under-18s could perhaps be collecting glasses or undertaking similar activities whilst the premises are open and the sexual entertainment is, is taking place, which we do, not believe, we, we do not believe is acceptable. That's why the bill was introduced it made clear that under-18s should never be on the premises while sexual entertainment is taking place. I have now fully considered the concerns raised over the employment of under-18s within such venues. And in response, we have brought forward Amendment 19. This amendment would remove the provision in the Bill which would have permitted a young person to be employed by a sexual entertainment venue. Amendment 22 does likewise, as has been outlined by Cara Hilton. Therefore, both these amendments will mean that under-18s should not generally be able to access such venues. However, the Government amendment goes further in protecting uh, the provisions, it, uh, I think, it has, which has come about as a result of a misunderstanding over how the law works in this area that has led to some stakeholders confusing the impact of both these amendments, and I hope to set that clear here this afternoon. The Civic Government Scotland Act 1982 includes a provision for a reasonable excuse that will permit a young person to be in a sexual entertainment venue. Cara Hilton's amendment would simply remove the provision in this bill relating to the employment without addressing the reasonable excuse in the 1982 Act and would therefore permit a young person to be in such a venue at any time, including when sexual entertainment is being provided, if that young person has a reasonable excuse. It will be a matter for the courts to determine what might constitute a reasonable excuse. However, the Government's amendment would restrict the availability of this defence of a reasonable excuse to being available only when the sexual entertainment venue was no, sexual entertainment was not taking place. That is, under Amendment 19, no person under 18, whether an employee or otherwise, will be permitted on the premises whilst entertainment is taking place, and only where there is a reasonable excuse for, the, for that young person will they be permitted within the premises when no entertainment is taking place. Cara Hilton's amendment does not go this far. Therefore, President Officer, 
Both the Government Amendment and Cara Hilton's amendment remove the provision in the Bill prevent, permitting an under-18 to be employed in a sexual entertainment venue. However, Cara Hilton's amendment is less restrictive that the government's than the Government's amendment in that it would continue to allow for a reasonable excuse defence to be applied at all times, whereas Amendment 19 restricts that defence to only times when SH entertainment is not taking place. The Government Amendment... I will give way to the member. Liam MacArthur. I am very grateful to uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary for, for giving way. He will be aware of the uh, Children's Commissioner's concerns, specifically in relation to that point where he says that Amendment 19 shifts the focus from young people in an employment capacity to young people more generally and goes on to say there is therefore the possibility that venue owners could find ways for younger children and young people to be legitimately allowed to enter sexual entertainment venues. How would he respond to that very specific concern of the Children's Commissioner? Unfortunately, the Children's Commissioner has got the law wrong in this area because of the reasonable excuse provision which is actually provided for in the Civic Government Scotland Act 1982, which has not been addressed. And that's why the Government's amendment is addressing that particular point. The Government amendment makes it clear that no person under 18 can ever be employed in a sexual entertainment venue. It makes it clear that no under-18 can be on the premises when sexual entertainment is taking place. And finally, it makes it clear that even when sexual entertainment is not taking place, an under-18 can only be on the premises if it is shown that there is good reason for them being there. For these reasons, I would ask Parliament to reject Amendment 22 and instead support Amendment 19, which gives further restrictions to protecting young people. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now call on Ken McIntosh. Thank you, President Officer. And uh, in speaking of support of the, the powerful words of my colleague Cara Hilton uh, in our Amendment 22, I would simply draw members' attention to the excellent briefing from the Children's, Scotland's Children's Commissioner. Mr. Well, can I... Can I suggest the Minister made an argument based on legal advice. It was remarkably unconvincing for me. And <laughs> remarkably unconvincing. He made, he made, he made a, a, an argument that we should have reasonable excuse. Order. Order. And I have to say that the Children's Commissioner has laid this out very clearly, a very clear argument. He says that he's concerned that a young person working in a sexual entertainment venue is likely to be at increased risk of grooming or exploitation by their employer or those associating with them. He says that even if sexual entertainment is not taking place at the time the young person is present, it's likely that the environment itself is unsuitable. For example, sexually explicit materials may be in display. And he points out that a young person will be working in an environment where sexual entertainment is normalised and therefore may form a view that sexual entertainment is an acceptable form of employment for them. And he concludes very clearly, a sexual entertainment venue is no place for a child or young person. Presenting officer, it's very difficult to disagree with either the Children's Commissioner's uh, observations or his conclusions, and I would urge members to follow the recommendations of the Commissioner to support my colleague Cara Hilton and to reject the Minister's amendment. Many thanks. And so I now call on Cara Hilton to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, um, there's, I think there's a real danger that the Bill, as it as it's drafted, could put children and young people at risk of harm. My amendment today will remove the option of any under 18 year old being employed by a sexual entertainment venue. And it will ensure Order. that these venues Order. can't be accessed Allow by Cara children Hilton to be and heard, under 18 please. year olds in any circumstances or at any time. I'm not convinced at all by the arguments uh, that have been made by the Cabinet Secretary. I think that Amendment 19 by allowing venues a reasonable excuse, no. Um, I've no time, sorry. By allowing venues a reasonable excuse to allow young people on the premise, 
I think it opens up many loopholes which will put young people, and especially young women, at risk of sexual exploitation. Presiding officer, these venues are completely unsuitable for young people at any time. Today we've got an opportunity to send out a strong message about the type of Scotland we want to see, and I want to see a Scotland that protects our children, protects our young people from harm and exploitation, and which challenges the objectification of women and girls. I urge the Chamber to vote for MMI Amendment 22 today and reject Amendment 19. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. This will be a, a one-minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 22 is yes 33, no 67. There were 14 abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 19 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary to move. Moved. Many thanks. And the question is that amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not. There will therefore be a division. I beg your pardon. Yes, I understood it correctly. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. So the result of the vote in Amendment 19 is yes, 84, no, 28. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore agreed. Now move to Group 10, and I call Amendment 20 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary in a group on its own. Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 20, please. Officer, I'm pleased to be able to move Amendment 20. Uh, the Scottish Government strongly believes that the proposed licensing uh, scheme for sexual entertainment venues is a step forward from the current arrangements. This will allow the local authority to exert greater control over what goes on and is permitted in its area. It has always been envisaged uh, that a local authority uh, that seeks to license sexual entertainment in their area will have to undertake a full and proper exercise to reach a determination of how to approach the licensing function. In other words, they will have to adopt a policy with respect to the exercise of their function in relation to licensing sexual entertainment venues. This amendment formalises that by requiring that a policy statement is prepared and published. It also requires that in preparing their policy, the authority should focus upon listed objectives. Some of these objectives are traditional licensing issues, such as the need to prevent nuisance and crime and protect children and young people from harm. We have also included the objective of reducing violence against women. So it's clear to the local authority that this important issue is at the heart of the licensing regime. 
Part of the licensing authority's role will be to ensure improved working conditions and a safer environment for the women who work in these venues. The Scottish Government will produce statutory guidance to assist local authorities in developing their policies. Once prepared, the local authority must have regard to their policy statement when exercising their functions in relation to the licensing of sexual entertainment venues. So the policy statement will need to be considered when preparing a list of persons or bodies who are to receive copies of licence applications or deciding to grant on deciding to grant such an application. This will ensure that the policy statement is fully embedded into the licensing process. The amendment also lays out the mechanics of how and when the policy statement should be published and reviewed. And I move Amendment 20. Thanks. Uh, I now call on Cara Hilton. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for engaging with myself and with Zero Tolerance Trust in respect of Amendment 20 and also the earlier Amendment 18? I am pleased that this amendment and the earlier amendment reflects many of the issues that I raised during the Stage 2 proceedings in respect, in respect of both consulting with Violence Against Women Partnerships and obliging local authorities to produce a licence and policy statement. The amendment is important because it will ensure that local authorities um, offering a licence for a sexual entertainment venue are do fully consider the wider public pro policy priorities, such as tackling violence against women and protecting young people from harm. There is absolutely no doubt there needs to be a lot more public scrutiny before these venues are granted licences. And this amendment will hopefully ensure more joined up thinking in our policy at local and national level. And I am very happy to offer my support. Many thanks, Cabinet Secretary, to wind up or not. So we will move straight to the question. And the question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Many thanks, and that brings us to the end of amendments. And the next item of business is a debate now on motion number 13606 in the name of Michael Matheson on the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to please press their request to speak buttons now. And I call now on Michael Matheson to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes, please. Officer, I'm pleased to open the Stage 3 debate on the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill. For the purposes of Rule 9.11 of the Standing Orders, I wish to advise the Parliament that Her Majesty, having been informed of the purports of the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill, has consented to place her prerogative and interests, so far as they are affected by the Bill, at the disposal of the Parliament for the purposes of the Bill. As members are aware, the Bill sets out a new licensing regime for air, we air weapons and amends the existing alcohol licensing and civic licensing regimes. I'd like to thank the past and present members of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee for their detailed scrutiny of this Bill over the past 13 months. I am also grateful to the Finance Committee and the Delegated Pearls and Law Reform Committee for their consideration of the Bill. The Local Government and Regeneration Committee uh, invited a wide range of stakeholders to give evidence at Stage 1. That evidence, as well as the Stage 1 report, which supported the general principles of the Bill, has proven to be extremely valuable in helping the Government to reflect on whether we had the provisions exactly right. The Stage 2 committee meeting helped us to further refine the Bill, ensuring that we have a Bill in front of us today that will make a number of significant improvements to the relevant licensing regimes. We have a long-standing commitment, President Officer, to reduce gun crime, and the licensing of air weapons has been central to that aim. It featured in our manifesto of 2007 and 2011, and the powers to regulate air weapons were finally devolved to this Parliament in the Scotland Act 2012. We have acted on this new power, consulting widely with experts and the public. Our proposals have not always been universally welcomed, but we believe they strike the right balance between respecting the interests of those people who shoot legitimately for work, sport, pest control or leisure, and the need to ensure that those who misuse guns do not have access to them. This, 
I'll give way to the member, of course. I'm, I'm grateful, Mr. Cabinet Secretary. Secretary. Thank you. And I appreciate him uh, verifying that the principal purpose of, of this proposal is to reduce crime involving air weapons. But can he tell me what evidential backup he has to suggest that this measure will, in fact, reduce gun crime w using air weapons, which is already at an almost record low level? Well, the member is correct to say that uh, uh, gun crimes is at almost a record low level. However, within that gun crime, almost half of all the offences involve weapons which are air weapons. And what the member may have also noticed from the most recent statistics were published, in the area where there was an increase in gun crime, it was with air weapons in themselves. So I believe having a licensing regime will assist us more effectively to make sure that those who are not suitable for having these weapons do not have access to them. This legislation, though, is not a ban on air weapons in Scotland, but those who shoot should not have access to firearms, including those who deliberately or maliciously target property, animals or other people, will no longer be allowed to have air weapons. This will help better protect the public from suffering harm at the hands of those who misuse air guns. We, uh, when publishing the committee's stage one report, the convener Kevin Stewart said, and I quote, there is no doubt air weapons are dangerous. That is why we welcome plans to introduce a licensing regime. It is a timely and an important piece of work. I certainly welcome and agree with Kevin Stewart's remarks, and I'm sure that the majority of members will also agree and support these provisions. Alcohol licensing is a topic of constant interest in this Parliament. This part of the bill is largely focused on quite technical issues. We know that outdoor drinking dens attract vulnerable young people, placing them at both immediate and long-term risk. That is why the bill creates offences in relation to the supply of alcohol by adults to children and young people in a public place. This will give the police the power they require to address the problem of drinking dens. A fit and proper test is being introduced for both premises and personal licences, and licensing boards will also be able to consider spent offences. These changes were, wide, were widely called for to ensure that only those who are suitable can hold a licence. We are also clarifying that licensing boards, when considering over-provision, may determine that the whole of its area is a single locality. We have also listened to calls for licensing boards to provide greater clarity about how they carry out their business. Therefore, as well as imposing a duty on boards to annually report on their income expenditure, the bill also requires boards to publish an annual report on exercise of their functions. Various members also express concerns about the five-year ban on someone reapplying for a personal licence after they have had their licence revoked for failure to submit a refresher training certificate. They, uh, we are removing this particular ban, and this will come into effect following the day of royal assent. The bill improves the effectiveness also of civic licensing regimes with a variety of reforms across a wide range of areas. The bill will deliver and, uh, and improve the regime for the licensing of metal dealers. This will raise standards within the industry and make it more difficult for metal thefts, thieves to convert uh, their proceedings into, from crime into cash. The bill ensures all dealers are licensed, bans the use of cash as payment for scrap, tightens record-keeping arrangements and requires proper identification of customers. It also increases the scope of licensing to capture some important peripheral activities such as door-to-door -door collectors. It increases penalties for licensing offences and creates a power that will enable the creation of a register of metal dealers. I would like to take this opportunity to place on, my record, my th on record my thanks for those who have helped to develop the proposals in this regard, particularly the British Metal Recycling Association, who have represented the interests of the many legitimate and reputable scrap metal dealers. Also, the British Transport Police, who have actively led the fight against metal theft in recent years. 
The bill also allows communities a greater say over whether sexual entertainment, for example, lap dancing, takes place, a place within their area by allowing local authorities the power to provide for a licensing regime for such, an a, for, for such a provision in their area, thereby controlling the number of licences granted for sexual entertainment venues. Central to this is the belief that the voice of local communities should be heard and that local authorities should have a clear influence over whether an activity like sexual entertainment should be taking place within their area. Local authorities are best placed to reflect the views of the communities they serve and determine whether sexual entertainment establishments should be authorised and also under what conditions. I also welcome the amendments to the Bill that reinforce the role that imposes proper control over sexual entertainment venues and how they can assist in tackling uh, violence against women. Whilst I applaud the role that many individuals and organisations have played in getting us to this particular point, Sign Officer, I particularly want to recognise Sandra White, who has worked tirelessly over many years to highlight these issues and to push for the introduction of this licensing regime. Sign officer, the bill also makes a small number of changes in relation to the taxi and private hire car licensing regime. Local authorities are responsible for these hire car licensing regimes. They have discretion in applying a local regime that best meets the specific requirements of their local area and can take account of the view of both customers and trade. In general, this local process, I believe, works well. Specific provisions in the Bill include the power to refuse to grant private hire car licences on the grounds of over-provision. The extension of driver testing to allow testing of private hire car drivers and the removal of the contract exemption to the licensing and regulation of taxis and private hire cars, bringing hire cars used on contract into the licensing regime. The bill also simplifies and improves licensing arrangements by, for example, providing for the licensing of theatres within the public entertainment licensing regime. Officer, I have set out the Government's thinking on some of the key areas within what is a wide-ranging bill, and I move that the Parliament agrees the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill be passed. Many thanks. And before I call Cara Hilton, I would wish to inform the Chamber that in order to allow everyone to speak in the debate, I have determined that decision time will take place at ten past five. Now call on Cara Hilton. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by echoing the Cabinet Secretary's comments and thanking all involved in devoting time and energy to support us in scrutinising the Air Weapons and Licensing Bill. Um, in particular, I would like to thank the parliamentary staff for the support they provided to the Local Government and Regeneration Committee during the Bill's progress. I joined the committee midway through the process, so missed out on many of the early evidence sessions, but would like to place on record my thanks to all those witnesses and interest groups who have engaged with the committee and provided evidence on the wide range of topics covered by this bill. I thank to the Cabinet Secretary for his willingness to work with committee members and MSPs to improve the bill and for engaging and responding constructively to all stakeholders involved. The bill before us today is certainly a bill of many parts, introducing a new licensing regime for air weapons, as well as reforming local authority licensing functions in respect of alcohol, taxi and private hire cars, scrap metal dealers and theatres. The bill also introduces a new licensing regime for sexual entertainment venues. According to the policy memorandum, the aim of the bill is to protect public safety, to preserve public order, to reduce crime and to advance public health. And in the stage two debate back in April, my colleague Alec Rowley suggested that combining this diverse range of subjects and objectives into one single bill, a bill in itself which is based possibly on outdated legislation, perhaps isn't the best way to legislate. And I hope this is something that the Scottish Government and future Scottish Governments can reflect on in the future. In fact, the committee's original report in the bill stated that the bill is what could be described as a bit of a pick and mix, and I think that sums up the situation pretty well. 
Scottish Labour will be supporting the bill today, although we obviously certainly don't believe the bill is perfect. Um, in respect of alcohol lic licensing, we do think considerable progress has been made in this area, and I was pleased that the amendments um, that were tabled have been accepted um, and the reassurance that was given to Dr Richard Simpson about his amendment and that work um, is underway in that area. Um, and we are concerned that some parts of Section 68 of the Bill, as amended by the Government today, could put children and young people at risk. And obviously I am disappointed that uh, my amendment to totally ban under-18s from sexual entertainment venues has been rejected, despite having the backing of the Commissioner for Children and Young People, Bernardo Scotland, Zero Tolerance Trust, Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland. I am disappointed that the Scottish Government believes it is acceptable for young people to have access to sexual entertainment venues if owners can come up with a reasonable excuse. Um, I think this is a direct contradiction to a range of key Scottish Government policies, policies which Scottish Labour supports, such as Getting It Right for Every Child, the Children and Young People's Scotland Act. And I think it is inconsistent too with the Scottish Government's strategy on violence against women. Okay. The Secretary. The point I was making about her amendment and the government's amendment in re relation to under-18s having access to sexual entertainment venues, had we gone with the amendment that she had set out, the reasonable excuse defence could have been used at any time when that venue was being used for sexual entertainment or not being used for sexual entertainment, whereas the government's amendment bans under-18s from being in the premises and also closes down the use of that reasonable excuse defence so that it can't be used for a young person to be on the premises when sexual entertainment is taking place. That's the provisions that we now have in the law under this bill. Well, obviously, that is one interpretation. I'm not convinced with those arguments. I mean, I, I, tabled, I tabled this same amendment at stage two, and this, I didn't hear those arguments then. This is the first time today that I've heard those arguments, so um, I'm a bit doubtful about the validity. Um, as, the, so I, and I've lost my place now, that's the trouble. No. Um, Order. I'm, right, I'm pleased that the Scottish Government have brought forward positive amendments in this area um, that will improve not notification procedures and require local authorities to fully consider the impact of licensing sexual entertainment venues on local authorities' wider objectives, such as reducing violence against women and protecting children and young people. I hope this will give local communities a bigger voice in whether these venues can operate in their local areas. The Cabinet Secretary's amendments in these areas has very much reflect uh, what I was hoping to achieve in my own amendments at stage two. So this is welcome progress and hope we can develop more joined up policy making at local and national level um, and building towards the type of Scotland we all want to see. The sex industry can never be allowed to operate in a vacuum and I think our approach really needs to reflect the goals um, in Equally Safe of a Scotland where all individuals are equally safe and respected and which all our, our town centres and our city centres are welcoming to all. Until now, this is an industry which has effectively been unregulated, and therefore, while this bill is far from ideal, the new licensing regime it proposes is certainly better than what we have now. But I do think, um, regardless of the debates about um, the legalities of it, I think we've got to be very vigilant in monitoring the new regime. I think there is a real risk that in licensing these venues, that the Scottish Government risks normalising what is a harmful form of sexual exploitation. As Zero Tolerance Trust pointed out in their original evidence to the Local Government Committee. If we are to move beyond women's value and worth being located in their bodies and their perceived sexual attractiveness, we need to move beyond seeing sexual entertainment venues as normal and harmless. We need to challenge a culture where women and girls are viewed and treated as sexualised objects. And I think a failure to send out a clear message on this is a failure to our young people. In respect of taxis and private hire cars, there is absolutely no doubt that this is a rapidly changing industry and it is vital that the legislation reflects the pace of change. During the committee's evidence sessions, there was certainly real concern about um, whether the bill would be robust enough um, and future-proofed enough to, to protect taxi app companies from bypassing local regimes. I hope that it will be, but obviously only time will tell. I know that the Scottish Taxi Federation were pleased with the assurances that they received from the Cabinet Secretary, and we all um, agree that it is vital that there is a level, a level playing field and a fairer deal for all in this sector. In respect of air weapons, Scottish Labour fully supports the proposals in this bill. It is estimated that 500,000 air guns are owned by people right across Scotland. This bill will rightly require anyone who owns one to demonstrate a legitimate reason for having such a weapon. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that these air weapons are dangerous. The tragic death two year, uh, of two-year-old Andrew Morton ten years ago and the heartache that his family continue to endure every day highlights the real pressing need to act to prevent future tragedies. 
Today, half of all firearms offences involve, involve the use of an air weapon, and every single day our police officers and animal welfare groups have to deal with the consequences of these weapons being misused. So the proposals in this bill are very welcome and they will ensure that Scotland has got a strong and a robust air weapons licensing regime. In respect of metal dealers and metal theft, again, the bill's proposals are very welcome and will bring Scotland in line with the rest of the UK. Metal theft is a big issue in many of our communities. It's never a victimless crime, and the provisions in this bill will hopefully strengthen the licensing of metal dealing, reduce metal theft and related criminal activity, which not only inconveniences the public, but endangers the public and, de and indeed endangers offenders too. Um, I notice I've run out of time, so in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, well, this bill is not without its flaws. Many of the proposals it contains are very welcome and it's certainly a step in the right direction. Scottish Labour will be supporting the bill today and I look forward to the rest of the debate. Thanks very much. I now call on Alex Ferguson. Five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. In opening the debate for the Scottish Conservatives, I'm very sorry to say that I find myself every bit as perplexed about the bill now as I was at stage one. The vast majority of it is greatly to be welcomed, particularly the provisions on alcohol licensing, metal dealers and public and sexual entertainment venues. In general, although I think the jury is still out, perhaps on some of the provisions relating to the licensing of taxis and private cars, parts two and three of this bill are broadly to be welcomed, particularly, if I may say so from a constituency point of view, the rescinding of the five-year ban uh, in, in the event of the renewal of a personal licence when that has run out. That is common sense and very practical measure, and I welcome it. Indeed, I think the tightening up of existing licensing provisions are largely sensible and would, had they been considered on their own, have attracted undoubtedly the unanimous support of this chamber. But our problem on these benches, which will come as no surprise to members, is with part one. The new licensing provisions, not, please note, tightening up of existing ones, the new licensing provisions that relate to the air weapons regime that the government wishes to introduce. For us, this is a red line issue that also involves an important point of democratic principle, which is that we believe that part one of this bill should always have been a separate piece of legislation. During the stage one debate, Kevin Stewart intervened on me to ask what might be different in a separate bill that would make me support it. Well, the answer to that is quite possibly nothing, presiding officer, but the point is that we could have had a clear debate and decision-making processes on a completely new area of licensing provision while almost certainly unanimously agreeing on a separate bill that covered parts two and three. So we are forced on these benches into a position of being unable to support this bill, despite being very much in agreement with a large part of it. And I want to spend the brief time available to me in trying to explain why we are so opposed to part one. At stage one, I raised a concern that the most recent statistics on air weapon offences, which should have been published in November 2014, would not be published until October this year, almost a year late. And then, lo and behold, presiding officer, they have now been published, and they show that air weapon offences are at their second lowest level in the last decade. 0.06% of all reported crime in Scotland, a drop of 73% from their peak. So against that background, the possessors of the estimated 500,000 air guns in Scotland are to undergo a process to license them to possess air guns. That process is to be carried out by officers of Police Scotland, not the trained civilian specialist firearms officers whose numbers are being reduced from 34 mm -hmm. to 14 as we speak, but by rank and file police officers with no previous experience of weaponry at all and whose training, I am very reliably informed, is consisting largely of learning about the legislation involved, rather than any hands-on weaponry training that might actually help them prepare for the task they're going to have to undertake. And I'm equally reliably informed that Police Scotland have a current backlog of over 500 shotgun and firearms licence applications at this point in time. So one can only begin to imagine what additional pressures the air gun licensing regime is going to have on them. Now, once a licence or permit has been gained, it will not be required to purchase the ammunition for these weapons. That, and that can only result in those holders of air guns who don't actually bother or want to get a licence or permit, and everybody agrees that there will be many of them, having no difficulty at all in obtaining ammunition for them. And I might suggest, presiding officer, that those most likely to carry out air gun crimes are also those who are probably least likely to bother to get a permit especially one that costs somewhere in the region of £80. So I'm afraid I do not believe and I do not accept that this new regime will have any impact on crime statistics whatsoever. 
In speaking to amendments one and two earlier this afternoon, I suggested that they would reduce, those amendments would reduce bureaucracy, expense and unnecessary use of human resources. Had they been accepted, I'm sure they would have had that impact, but they weren't. So what we are left with is a bill that will create a whole new layer of bureaucracy and expense that will take up countless hours of police officers' time to bring in a licensing regime that will do nothing to reduce the minute amount of crime that a minuscule number of air gun owners or possessors currently commit. And I repeat what I said earlier, that this seems to me to be the perfect example of taking a sledgehammer to crack a nut and that the sledgehammer is being welded by a Scottish government, wielded, sorry, by a Scottish government that preaches the gospel of cutting down on unnecessary red tape, expense and time wasting at every possible opportunity, almost defies belief. Presiding officer, we do not believe that this sledgehammer will crack the targeted nut anyway. All it will do is place an unnecessary increased burden on thousands of perfectly law-abiding citizens, and that is not something that we on these benches can support. Thank you. Thanks very much. And we now move to open debate. Four minute speeches. Kevin Stewart to be followed by Elaine Murray, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, in April this year, uh, we debated and agreed the general principles of the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill. Today, we debate the bill in the form it is hopefully to be passed. Although there is no formal role for me in this debate as the convener of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, I'd like to use some of my time today to share the work of the committee and its effect effectiveness in realising change. As I pointed out in the Stage 1 debate, licensing is an important role to play. It is an integral, it's integral to preserving public order and safety, reducing crime and advancing public health. A key aim of the bill is also to improve the efficiency of the operation of the licensing regimes, contributing to the creation of a better regulatory environment for business. The bill is wide-ranging, uh, including the creation of new licensing systems in Scotland for the use of air weapons and the operation of sexual entertainment venues. The bill also amends the existing licensing systems in alcohol sales, uh, scrap metal dealers, taxis and private car, car hires and public entertainment venues. The importance of these regimes and the obje objectives they seek to reinforce cannot be underplayed. Our level of engagement with key stakeholders allowed us to make meaningful changes to the bill, which will improve the effectiveness of the provisions. Uh, for example, uh, the bill now enables the sale of air weapons to customers in the rest of Great Britain, requires alcohol licensing boards to publish annual reports outlining how they have contributed to the licensing objectives, empowers licensing authorities to deal with issues connected to advertising of sexual entertainment venues, updates the definition of metal dealers so as to include those who do, do not buy metal but sell it, uh, more clearly defines the forms of payments to metal dealers and provides the legislative framework for the creation of a national database for metal dealers. The work uh, of the committee uh, has led to some major change in this bill from uh, the start at stage one. Um, and I, I think that the vast bulk uh, of the work that we have done has been pretty cooperative. But today, um, I think we have seen uh, where there has been division and mistake because of misunderstandings uh, that there have been. I have to say that I was rather disappointed uh, that a committee member was briefing against colleagues in the press. And I'm going to be very interested today um, to see how some colleagues have actually uh, voted uh, in certain amendments, particularly on Amendment 19. I would like to um, thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary um, for uh, being uh, extremely cooperative in trying to ensure that we get this bill absolutely right. Uh, and I, I think that um, uh, we have, as I said earlier, made great moves in terms of getting it right. And I'll give you one example, presiding officer, and that's in terms of the penalties uh, for metal theft. Um, we believed as a committee that they were far too lenient, the proposals that were put uh, originally, uh, and now we see a fine of up to £20,000 and or up to six months in prison. And I believe uh, that that 
we've reached that conclusion because of the work uh, of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. In conclusion, presiding officer, I believe the bill now strikes the right balance. It allows both businesses and ordinary folk to go about their lives while seeking to pre prevent or reduce the harm caused by those who would seek to avoid regulation or carry out criminal acts. The Air Weapons and Licensing Bill is proportionate to the issues being tackled, and that is why I will be voting in favour of this bill at decision time today. Thank you, presiding officer. Thanks so much. And I call on Dr Elaine Murray to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. It has never been the intention of people who support the bill to ban air weapons, but to regulate them. Air weapons can and sadly do kill. And it is wrong that anyone who wants to can keep and use a lethal weapon without any checks on why they have them or whether they can be relied on to use the weapon in a responsible way and for a legitimate purpose. And I am pleased that this bill will rectify that situation. Like other members, I was lobby lobbied to exclude people who already hold a, a firearms licence. Uh, and as I said earlier, the bill excludes them from some of the licence tests, but not all. And that, again, in my opinion, is correct. Because although a person who has a firearm may well be a suitable person to, to also have an air gun licence, they may not have a good reason for doing it. And it is correct that the Chief Constable should also be required to ascertain that they have a good reason for having an air weapon. I note the concerns raised in the Law Society Stage 3 briefing that there are around half a million air weapons in Scotland which can't be properly traced and may be sold off or given away in advance of the legislation coming into force rather than being into the, uh, handed into the police. Uh, and I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary has a strategy to try and encourage people to hand in uh, their weapons rather than possibly give them away and have them circulating illegally in, in, in the country. The Law Society also make the point in that briefing that the purchase of ammunition is not regulated and there is no requirement in the bill, for example, to produce the weapons certificate when purchasing ammunition. I suspect, actually, maybe that the purchase of ammunition may still be reserved. I think perhaps it is just the licensing of air weapons which has been handed over to us and therefore it wasn't possible for that to be addressed here and maybe it is something that needs to be addressed at Westminster. I believe that the regulation of air weapons will provide, protect people, domestic pets and wild animals. It is indeed very difficult to assess the numbers of wild animals which have been injured or killed by air weapons as they may die in places where their carcasses will never be discovered. Now, I personally, this is just a personal view, uh, was a bit concerned about an amendment passed at stage two which allows young people to use air guns for pest control because the bill had all, only permitted young people who are commercial pest controllers or employed by them to shoot pests. Now, I completely accept that shooting can be a very humane method of, of pest control in the right hands, but I'm a bit concerned by that stage two amendment that untrained young people, or indeed even, indeed even untrained adults, could be using air guns to shoot live animals, potentially causing them significant suffering if the animal is not instantly dispatched. And I hope and seek the Cabinet Secretary's reassurances on whether other legislation, such as the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006, may provide sufficient protection for wild animals, which may be considered pests, but they, after all, they are still sentient creatures and may indeed suffer badly if untrained individuals are taking pot shots at them in the name of uh, pest control. The issue of scrap metal dealers, which I mentioned during the Stage 1 briefing, having discussed the bill with a local and very reputable metal de dealer, I was pleased to note that the Government at Stage 2 introduced amendments to pre prevent a scrap metal de dealer from paying in cash by clarifying that only a bank or building society account may be used when undertaking a sale of metal. I think that is very welcome. Uh, this will help prevent the theft of scrap metal, which has been a serious problem for some time, to, uh, all the time, in fact, since metal prices rose and can have serious consequences for public safety and obviously public convenience too. Amendments were made to... Uh, uh, to to record-keeping requirements and to establishing the re a register of metal detail, details, all of which are very welcome and which have been argued for. On the issue of sexual entertainment venues, I think it is absolutely correct that local government takes responsibility to, uh, to, to regulate these, to le legislate for these, and uh, in conjunction with listening to the views of uh, the local community. I agree that councils are the best people to do this. I also tri uh, pay tribute to Sandra White and others who have campaigned on this for many close, years. Please. It is easy to be portrayed as uh, a bit of a killjoy and illiberal when you take these, these issues on. But this is rightly, people in, in this chamber recognise that commercial sexual exploitation is indeed a form of violence against women. Thanks very much. Now call on Liam MacArthur, followed by Sandra White. 
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I join others in thanking uh, Kevin Stewart's committee uh, and indeed the witnesses for the work that they've carried out on uh, what is, by common consent, uh, a, a, a wide-ranging and complex bill. I think Cara Hilton was right to remind us uh, the committee's own observation that it was a bit of a, a pick-and-mix pick uh, bill. And I, I think have sympathy for the view that it's actually two bills masquerading uh, as one. And I think Alec Ferguson quite rightly pointed to the implications of that uh, when we come to the final stages in the vote uh, today. The Cabinet Secretary has been his characteristic reasonable and, and measured self and I, I think has sought to deal uh, with the amendments before us today uh, in, in, that, uh, in that way, though I am disappointed that uh, there wasn't a willingness to accept uh, some of the amendments in relation to air guns and I'll turn to that uh, in a minute. But um, there is much uh, in this bill that we welcome, part two on uh, alcohol licensing, part three on civic licensing set out reforms with which we strongly agree and I think uh, Kevin Stewart articulated those very fairly in his observations. If I, if I point to a couple of examples, the closing of the loophole which means that whilst illegal to buy alcohol for a child, it is legal to buy alcohol to share with a child in a public place and creating additional record keeping requirements on scrap metal dealers including to record the identity of those who sell metal are both very, very eminently sensible moves. But the fact remains that a great deal of the bill relates to the licensing of air weapons, an issue on which we have consistently voiced our concerns. My colleague Tavish Scott um, did so during the stage one debate. Uh, those have unfortunately uh, not been adequately addressed in the meantime. There have been opportunities to do so, uh, most recently this afternoon, and we welcome Alec Ferguson's amendments, which sought, I think, a practical way ahead on some of these issues, while also lifting the burden on those already struggling to manage existing gun licensing, uh, licensing requirements, where there is, uh, as Alec Ferguson indicated, a backlog. The government is rightly concerned about public saf safety, but crime statistics suggest that the number of incidents involving air weapons is small and falling. Evidence to the committee was very clear about that. I do not dispute that problems exist. In justifying these proposals, current and previous Justice Secretaries cite well-publicised incidents where young children have been hurt by the inappropriate use of an air gun. These cases are appalling and have been roundly and rightly condemned. But those cases have also been prosecuted under the laws we already have. And I cannot see the evidence of how this bill will reduce the risk of these happening. At stage one, Tavish Scott called for a proportionate response to the problem. But the bill we have before us at this stage does not strike that right balance. The introduction of blanket restrictions will have a significant impact on individuals and practices that currently present absolutely no risk to public safety without necessarily providing any real deterrent for those intent on acting irresponsibly. Indeed, there is even an argument that it could encourage more people to trade up to more powerful weapons. Uh, and I would be interested uh, to know if this bill uh, has in any way been either island-proofed or rural-proofed, uh, as the uh, government has committed to do. Steps may need to be taken to address inappropriate ownership and use of air guns, but I fear that the proposals in this bill are more a way of allowing ministers to claim they are taking action than an effective response to any problem that exists. On that basis, and despite our welcome for many of the other aspects contained in the bill, we will not be able to support it when it comes to votes this evening. Thank you very much. Many thanks. I now call on Sandra White to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, can I just say it's a very important bill uh, with the uh, metal theft, air weapon licensing, alcohol licensing, and of course the uh, sexual entertainment venues. And I will limit my comments to the sexual entertainment venues part of the bill. Uh, I think many members here, and some have already mentioned, and I'm grateful for it, uh, the fact that I've been pursuing uh, the licensing of sexual entertainment venues for many, many years, too many years than I care to, to think of. And uh, I do want to thank the local government committee for all the work they did uh, on uh, this bill and this particular part of the bill and also the clerks who I see here uh, tonight also for the advice that they have given me and the help uh, to put forward uh, various uh, amendments which brings me on to thanking the Scottish Government and uh, the Cabinet Secretary for accepting uh, the bill into you know, this particular bill also but special thanks must go to uh, 
previous Cabinet Secretary, Kenny McCaskill, who I worked along with before in regards to the bill when I brought it to this chamber a number of years ago, and unfortunately opposition voted it down, but we didn't give in, and we brought it back again. So I do uh, thank uh, everyone who's helped bring it forward, but if it hadn't been for the previous Cabinet Secretary, Kenny McCaskill, I don't know if we would have got as far as this. So my thanks to everyone that uh, I have mentioned and perhaps others that I forgot uh, to mention. A uh, number of people have said uh, basically about the sexual entertainment licences, obviously lap dancing clubs. Uh, it's something which in my particular area I represent, uh, Glasgow City Centre, part of that. Uh, many people have came to me in that respect uh, regarding the proliferation of uh, lap dancing clubs in the city centre of Glasgow. And it was decided that it would be local authorities, and it's absolutely right. It cannot be a mandatory licensing. It must be for local authorities to represent the people in their authority. And with that, I do thank um, Councillor Coleman of Glasgow City Council, who gave me enormous help and enormous advice and support as well, pushing through uh, this part of the bill. I think it's uh, absolutely fantastic that uh, all the work that's went on from everyone concerned that we now come tonight at 10 past five to actually realise that uh, lap dancing sexual entertainment licences will actually basically, particularly if the local authority wishes there to be none in their area, then there will be none in their particular area. And that's what I think is called empowering local people, not just local authorities, but empowering local communities if they wish not to have this type of entertainment. Uh, others have said, and I've long said myself, it is a form of uh, violence against women. Uh, I've already mentioned about some of the, the examples I've had of people being in uh, these types of establishments. So all I can say is that uh, I think it's a, a really good piece of legislation that's came forward from uh, this Scottish Parliament uh, tonight. I know there are lots of people there within community councils and also not just women's groups, but groups throughout, not just Glasgow, but Scotland also, who very much welcome this piece of legislation. And the thought that uh, women can be objectified in the way of lap dancing and people paying uh, for that type of thing will be long gone when this uh, legislation comes forward. It's something, as I said, not just myself, but others have worked on for many, many years. And I do give my thanks to everyone who's helped me bring this forward and look forward to 10 past five tonight. We can finally say yes to supporting this bill and this particular piece of legislation. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by John Wilson. I welcome many of the changes brought about by this bill, although I think in due course there will need to be a more fundamental revision of the 1982 Act. Now, uh, just taking the different uh, areas and air guns, I accept, as Alex Ferguson says, this is not going to eliminate the problem totally, but I, I do believe, as with firearms legislation, it will make a significant difference. And I think it's right that it does parallel uh, firearms uh, legislation, because the reality is that air guns cause a great deal of harm to people, to pets, and to wild animals, and I think, therefore, it is absolutely right to have a fit and proper person test uh, and people should have to uh, have a, a reasonable and proper uh, uh, use for such uh, weapons. Now, in terms of alcohol, I know this is an issue that comes up very frequently at community councils, and I think there's some good progress from this bill as well. Again, the fit and proper person test for premises and personal license applications is, uh, is a good uh, measure. And I think also the focus renewed focus, uh, reinforced focus on over-provision so that that can relate to the whole board area. But I think Richard Simpson did make an important point in his uh, amendment that for communities to be able to object um, meaningfully and realistically to over-provision, they, uh, over they have to have the in for, uh, information, uh, which is why he wanted to have a national register. Now, that uh, uh, was not passed. I think, in fact, he, he with, withdrew the amendment because uh, some defect was pointed out uh, in it. But um, he did refer in his wind-up speech to um, section um, 12.6, uh, section 12, subsection 6, um, which relates to the 
uh, amendment today on annual reports, and I think it, it, it is possible through that subsection to provide this information that uh, uh, Richard Simpson was seeking, and I think the Minister, ex ex Cabinet Secretary, accepted that, and I hope he will keep Cabinet informed, <laughs> Parliament informed, sorry, about progress on that. Scrap metal, brief briefly, again, I think everybody welcomes this. We know there's a problem with metal theft, so anything that makes it more difficult to dispose of the metal has to be uh, a good thing. And last, but by no means least, sexual uh, entertainment. And uh, I think the provisions in the original bill about empowering local authorities and giving them the power to say no uh, is correct and widely welcome. But I think we should pay tribute to uh, Cara Hilton and Zero Tolerance for the way in which they have developed the policy in partnership with the Minister to a large extent over the last few weeks. And that's resulted, first of all, in the amendment today on a statement of policy uh, required by uh, uh, local authorities, and that statement of policy also should take the wider policy context into account. So that's a welcome uh, progress today. And also uh, the need to specifically notify particular local bodies. Again, uh, that would include community councils, obviously. It would include violence against women partnerships and uh, others following the statutory guidance which was announced by the Cabinet Secretary today uh, as well. So I think the main problem in this area today was, of course, the debate round Amendment 19 versus Amendment 22. And we all had very strong uh, 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 briefings from this, from both Bernardins, but particularly from the Children's Commissioner. And obviously we had previous briefings from Zero Tolerance who were very influential in emphasising the way in which uh, so, um, uh, sexual entertainment was uh, an example of the exec objectification of women, the sexual exploitation uh, of, of women, and therefore intrinsically undesirable. And therefore, I think we, people will understand why we supported Cara uh, Hilton's amendment in terms of nobody under 18. And I think we did have a problem when the Cabinet Secretary then introduced a whole lot of new arguments that had not been presented at stage two. Now, if this was a new amendment from Cara Hilton, of course, we wouldn't be able to complain. But this amendment in was last introduced minute. by Cara Hilton at stage two, and there was not one word of the explanation that we've had today. So it's really, it was absolutely impossible for us to assess what the Cabinet Secretary was saying, uh, and therefore, obviously, we, we, we stuck with Amendment 19, uh, uh, along with Zero Tolerance and the Children's Commissioner. Many thanks. I now call on John Wilson, after which we'll move the closing speeches. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I first take this opportunity to welcome the discussion and debate on what clearly are very important issues uh, for Scotland. The health and security of all those within Scotland is of the utmost concern, and this bill has created important discussion around these issues. And I welcome, uh, put on record, my welcome to the Cabinet Secretary, uh, his willingness to listen to and act on the discussions that took place both within the committee and elsewhere, particularly at stage two, and his acceptance of some of the clear issues that are being raised by external organisations. I can also put on record my thanks to the many organisations uh, that came and gave evidence to the committee and individuals who responded to the call for evidence, because I think without that evidence, the, some of the issues that have been discussed today uh, may not have been discussed because we might have lost those in the debate. But the bill itself covers a number of areas, as members have indicated, air weapons, alcohol licensing, taxi and private hire cars, metal dealers, licensing public entertainment venues and licensing sexual entertainment venues. And some of the debate that took place both at stage one and stage two have been lost because, in today's debate because we covered those issues and dealt with those issues in, in a consensual manner. And particularly things like licensing of public entertainment venues was accepted and adopted by all concerned because there was a confusion between the sexual entertainment venues licensing and how that may impact on public entertainment venues. So there have been some issues dealt with there. In terms of the metal dealers debate, we clearly heard the evidence in committee about the cost of metal theft in Scotland. And some of the evidence we heard, one witness indicated that, in, in written evidence, that it could be anything up to £40 million pounds, uh, to cost in Scotland for the metal theft that was taking place. And I'm glad that the fines have been increased to take account of this, the, the issues that have been raised because clearly we are not dealing with the, or targeting those who are seriously involved in metal theft and hopefully these fines will help deter some of these uh, characters and will also uh, safeguard communities throughout Scotland and safeguard their infrastructure. 
but to concentrate on air weapons, and I think there are issues about the interpretation of air weapons licensing. Uh, and I've had a number of representations from the airsoft community, uh, presiding officer, that are concerned about how the changes in the legislation may affect them. And I think it will be incumbent upon the Cabinet Secretary and guidance uh, and regulation in the future to ensure that the communities around those uh, airsoft issues are clear about what is covered within the licensing regime, because there are issues about the strength of the weapon being used, and the issues being raised are the advances in technology that are taking place, with, particularly in the airsoft area, mean that some of these weapons may soon become covered by the air weapons licensing that we're proposing today. So I would welcome the discussions that have taken place, and as I said, I welcome the fact the Cabinet Secretary has been so consensual. There have been areas, and I think Amendment 22 and Amendment 19 are one of these areas where the committee did, at stage two, go into some discussion about the relevant issues around that and the impact that certain provisions may have within the legislation in terms of employment, in terms of access uh, to sexual entertainment venues. So it's quite clear, and I'm glad the Cabinet Secretary brought forward an amendment today that uh, while the majority in the Chamber have accepted, uh, there's still much debate to be held out with the Chamber. So I will be supporting uh, the bill as presented at stage three today, presiding officer, and look forward to the implementation of that bill. And if needs to be worked on in the future, then look forward to that opportunity to do that. Thank you very much indeed. Many thanks. I will now move the closing speeches, and I call on Cameron McCannon up to four minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. The Air Weapons and Licensing Bill has drawn out areas of both consensus and contention, as today's debate has shown. As I've commented before, legislation should be passed only when it is targeted and effectively acts in the public's best interest. Where this has been the case, such as with metal dealers, it seems to me that the bill would improve matters. We've heard all over that how most, that we have the support of most metal dealers and also of our committee. It is, however, apparent that the aim of protecting people from unnecessary or unhelpful government intervention has not been applied throughout the bill. As a result, the Scottish Conservatives do, really do not believe that it's the best interest of the people in Scotland. A guiding principle throughout our consideration of this bill has been that law-abiding people should not find themselves unnecessarily caught under legislative net just because it's easier or politically expedient for the government to impose wide-reaching obligations. The provisions regarding air weapons are a case in point. Misuse of air weapons is confined to a tiny minority of users, as recently published statistics on recorded... Certainly. Okay, Mr. I, I thank Mr Buchanan for giving way and we recognise that there are a small minorities of abusers of these weapons but those weapons and the use of by abusers has led to the deaths of people in this country including as has been mentioned previously Andrew Morton. Surely it's right to act to ensure that we do not have any more deaths or, uh, or any other injuries by making sure that we have the right licensing regime in place. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. What evidence do we have that um, a licensing regime is going to prevent deaths? I really cannot see it. I don't think it's going to make any I think these people will go undercover. Let Mr Buchanan right. carry on. A guiding principle has been law binding by people. Sorry. Uh, the provisions regarding air weapons are a case in point. Misuse of air weapons is confined to, I think, a tiny minority of users, as recently published statistics on recorded crimes. Uh, for 2013 and 14 have confirmed. On a side note, it is very welcome that the Scottish Government finally changed its initial decision to wish hold publication of this data until well after today's debate. A targeted response to this small number of crimes involving air weapons would be to focus on better enforcement of existing laws. But this bill instead imposes an extensive and costly licensing process upon users. Furthermore, I think it is difficult to see how these provisions could be in the public's best interest regarding security when Police Scotland's already pressured resources could be invested instead in tackling crimes more prevalent than 0.06% involving air weapons. The administration of air weapons licensing would involve a disproportionately large commitment, as we've heard from my colleague here, of the police's resources, which may threaten the public security achieved through police operations in other areas. These major concerns imply themselves that the bill does not adhere to the principles of targeted and effective government, a position I think that is reinforced by provisions relating to the licensing of taxis and private hire vehicle market. 
There are legitimate concerns that drivers of private hire vehicles should have background checks and understand the needs of various passengers in order to protect consumers. An appropriate solution would be, I think, to allow only these tests, yet the bill would also permit the knowledge test to be required of all private hire drivers, despite the option to use perfectly adequate satellite navigation. This overreaching of the testing provisions, combined with the power of licensing authorities to refuse to grant a license for a private hire vehicle solely on the grounds of overprovision, has the effect that the bill does not act in the public's best interest. Experience elsewhere has indicated that an expanded supply of private hire vehicles would, bring lower, would lower prices and in doing so allow more people to afford regular use of private transport. Such a development would clearly be in the public's interest, yet the unnecessary testing provisions and anti-competitive ability to refuse licences on the grounds of overprovision would stand as barriers against this progress. Members no, closing. This would, plainly, this would plainly not be in the Scottish consumer's best interest. On the, there are some aspects of this bill that we, could be, that, we, that we agree with and could be beneficial. The problem is that they are bedded with this bill of so many parts that include aspects we cannot agree with. The welcome provisions include those relating to metal dealerships close, as well please. as some sensible reforms to theatre and sexual entertainment. However, our principles are not loose commitment that we wish to see fulfilled some of the time. To feel able to support the bill, it must be focused throughout on genuine improvements on behalf of the Scottish public, and it certainly should not violate the principles of targeted and effective government. Accordingly, presiding officer, the Scottish Conservatives regrettably were voting against the Air Weapons and Licensing Bill. Many thanks. Uh, now, Colin Ken McIntosh, up to six minutes, please, Mr. Thank you, presiding officer. And I'd like to thank, uh, to begin by thanking uh, not just all the members uh, present for their contribution to today's debate, but extending our appreciation to all of those out with Parliament who have taken the time to give evidence to help us shape this legislation. I'd like to give a particular thanks to members of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, to their clerks. Uh, and indeed to the Minister and his Bill team uh, for taking a constructive approach to this Bill. The Bill itself encompasses an odd mix uh, of policy objectives, but it is not without criticism, but overall is undoubtedly the stronger as a result of parliamentary scrutiny and amendment. In fact, before going on to talk about some of the issues covered in the legislation, I think it's worth putting on record that we, that is the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament, uh, may need to return to civic licensing sooner rather than later, I know the Minister said at stage one that he had no wish to review the 1982 Civic Government Scotland Act, uh, but evidence to the committee suggested that uh, the legislation is nearing the end of its shelf life. I think witnesses from both Edinburgh and Glasgow City Councils uh, suggested it was no longer fit for purpose, and others from the business community, for example, commented on the piecemeal nature of the uh, legislation following three decades of amendment. And even today, in fact, we had amendments um, opening up a whole new set of criteria which could arguably, arguably be applied in shaping our town and city centre activities. So I would urge the Minister to revisit the Local Government Committee's recommendation on this point and instigate a review. Uh, if passed today, the Bill will create a new offence relating to the possessing, purchasing or acquiring an air weapon without holding a valid air weapons certificate. And for those of us who remember the death of two-year-old Andrew Morton some ten years ago now, this law has been a long time in the making and is all the more welcome for that weight. I recognise that gun licensing generally uh, remains a divisive issue, and I'm conscious that we should not uh, subject the law-abiding air weapon owners of Scotland to what is sometimes regarded as the uh, tyranny of the majority. However, I believe in this case, the legislation is proportionate to the problems we still face as a society. The casual cruelty often inflicted on domestic pets, cats, dogs, even passing birds by irresponsible air gun users would, I think, be reason enough to introduce a more regulated form of ownership. The fact that half of all offences involving a firearm last year involved an air weapon is even more persuasive for me and my colleagues. And uh, in Scottish Labour, we're very pleased to be supporting this proposal today. Turning to the issue of uh, sexual entertainment venues, this whole area of licensing is fraught with difficulty. There is an argument, for example, that suggests if you license an activity, you are implicitly or even explicitly endorsing it. Mm -hmm. It's an issue that I came across when I was proposing a action on, sunbed, on, on skin cancer and sunbeds and proposed a civic government amendment. And there is this interpretation that you're actually almost approving these venues. And I'm sure there's many of us uh, in this chamber who do object to any such interpretation being made of our actions this afternoon. Women suffer, in fact, all of Scotland suffers from the objectification of women, from discrimination and violence against women. And it's something that's recognised in the Scottish Government's own policy. 
Equality groups uh, have mostly taken the view that they support sexual entertainment licensing on the, base, on the basis that it's better than unlicensed venues. However, concerns remain raised uh, by my colleague, Cara Hilton, uh, that this bill doesn't quite do enough to align with Scottish Government policy on gender equality. And I regret, for example, the fact that the proposals to restrict the display of sexualised images in public places accessible by, by children were not included in this bill, if even for discussion. I'm grateful to the organisation Child Eyes and once again to my colleague Cara Hilton for raising this issue during stages one and two of the bill. And I think worth noting the support for such a proposal from Girl Guiding through their Girls Matter campaign, highlighting the desire of young people to be subject to less objectifying and to stop children's exposure to harmful sexualised content in mainstream media. It's worth pointing out that this parliament has already acted to prevent the display of tobacco products because we deem them harmful. So I hope the Parliament has the opportunity to return to this issue at some point in the near future if we are to improve the environment in which we bring up not just our young girls, but all our children. This bill will uh, help empower licensing authorities to limit the number of private hire cars where there is over-provision and is welcome for that reason. However, stakeholders or many stakeholders have expressed their concern that the current legislation does not deal with the technological uh, challenges facing the industry. For example, remote booking through mobile apps and new operators whose business models are not based on traditional divisions between taxi and private hire cars. I believe the Cabinet Secretary has stated the Government is taking uh, separate steps to address this issue and I look forward to seeing the fruits of this work in due course. Uh, we are happy to welcome the measures in the Bill which take a firmer stance on scrap metal theft. The disruption caused by such crime causes great strain on our communities and on vital public services from train cables stolen from the railways to aluminium cables from pylons. The cost of these crimes is estimated to be £700 million to the Scottish economy each year. In particular, we welcome the proposal to establish a national register of metal dealers. This will help inform both buyers and sellers as to the, legitim the legitimacy of those they are dealing with and further protect them from unintentional law-breaking. And we are pleased that the Minister has agreed to amendments to not cause disruption to daily business practice. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, notwithstanding the rather animated discussion earlier about whether or not we should legislate to make reasonable excuse for a young person to be in a sexual entertainment venue, we have reached broad agreement on the bill before us today, and I would thank all my colleagues from across the chamber for the contribution they have made, and I look forward to seeing the benefits I hope this legislation will bring to our communities. Many thanks. I now call on Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, eight minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, and I've uh, listened with interest to all the members who have made a contribution in the course of our Stage 3 debate this afternoon. I think Cara Hilton described the bill as being a, a pick and mix because it does cover a variety of different areas where there was a need for uh, licensing provision to be made. But despite the uh, changes which have been made to this bill over the course of the uh, Stage 1 and 2 uh, processes uh, and the parliamentary scrutiny it has been subject to, I actually believe it's a bill which also uh, continues to fully deliver on what its original intentions actually were. And the parliamentary scrutiny process, I think, has it strengthened the provisions contained within the bill itself. In my uh, opening speech, President Officer, uh, I stated that I believe that the provisions uh, go a long way towards protecting uh, the public, pets, uh, wildlife uh, from the painful and, at times, pointless tragedies uh, that they are often subject to caused by the irresponsible use of things such as air weapons. Uh, earlier this afternoon before this debate I met with Sharon McMillan and her uh, family and friends. Sharon is the mother of Andrew Morton uh, who was tragically killed by an air weapon some 10 years ago. And Sharon and her husband Andy have campaigned tirelessly over the years uh, for something to be done about the dangers of air weapons. And I sincerely hope that the passage of this bill today with the support of uh, Parliament will provide them with some reassurance that we are delivering through this bill real progress and helping to ensure that nobody has to go through the same pain that they have as a family. So, officer... 
During the course of considering uh, this legislation, um, I have also uh, made sure that I listened very closely to concerns and issues that were raised by a range of uh, different stakeholders. And, uh, some issues were ranged, uh, raised around the implementation and the timing of uh, the legislation around uh, the introduction of the uh, licensing for air weapons. Uh, Elaine Murray uh, raised the very issue about an information campaign so that individuals are aware of the implications which that will have for them. And I can provide her with the reassurance that we already have work being taken forward in order to ensure that we have a sufficiently robust uh, and wide scale enough uh, information uh, campaign. We also intend to introduce some of the provisions within the legislation in order to allow the public and those who may hold a, uh, an air weapon some time in order to make a decision on whether they choose to uh, surrender that weapon or whether they wish to apply for a certificate for it as well. So it will take a bit of time, but there's already work being taken forward in order to ensure that uh, is being uh, progressed. And I know that Police Scotland and Turing organisations and our stakeholders uh, will all be keen to look at how that has progressed and also how the guidance uh, around this bill has also progressed. Now, I know that um, Alex Ferguson, on a number of occasions uh, today, both an intervention to myself and in his own uh, contribution, raised the issue about the evidence base for this particular piece of legislation. And he also uh, raised the issue of, uh, he also raised the issue of um, uh, uh, whether uh, this is disproportionate to the risks which are out there. And I think he made reference to the most recent uh, firearms statistics uh, and incidents involving firearms in Scotland. And I uh, welcome the fact uh, that, uh, uh, that gun crime is at a lower level than it was in 2007. But what that ignores, though, in that headline figure, is that the figures that were published just last week also show that there has been a rise in recorded offences for the first time in seven years involving firearms. And within that, air weapons, offences involving air weapons are up 6% uh, in that year. And that goes against the trend of shotguns and other forms of firearms. So I don't believe that we can be complacent in this matter. And given that almost 50% of all incidents that involve a firearm involve an air weapon, I think that gives a good signal to us on the need to make sure that we take proactive action in order to address this issue. And if Alex Ferguson and his colleagues, including Liam MacArthur, are not persuaded by myself in believing that this legislation in bringing in a licence around the provision of air weapons will prevent crime, you only have to look at the evidence that was put to the committee at stage one by Police Scotland, where they were very clear that a licensing regime for the provision of air weapons will help, to help them in reducing crimes associated with them, and at the same time, it will help to improve public safety. We cannot ignore that message, and that is why we are introducing this legislation. And I must confess, I do... Cabinet Secretary, one really minute, please. While I do not wish to dispel the end-of-term spirit, can we please curtail these vital conversations for just another two minutes, please? Can I say I do deeply regret that the fact that both the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats are not able to bring themselves to support this legislation here tonight. I think that is a matter to be regretted, and I think they will come to regret it as well in going forward. Can I also say that members have raised the issue around resourcing within Police Scotland. Police Scotland have also said to the committee they are taking forward a range of work in order to prepare for the introduction of this licensing regime. They are reviewing their existing licensing of firearms at the present moment in order to make sure that it is integrated in a single force rather than actually being in different component parts as was operating with the different forces in the past. And, and when Alex Ferguson raised issues about delays, there will at times be periods when there are delays because there is a spike in applications, but in general there is no overall delay in dealing with firearm certificates in Scotland. And there may be in individual cases where there is a need to make inquiries that there can be delays in matters. But I think I don't believe that a small number of incidents, over 180 last year, involving air weapons is insignificant. When it's not insignificant, when that harms or maims an individual or an animal. And I don't think we should dismiss that in the way in which I think he did here this afternoon as being insignificant. <laughs> Sign officer.
The Bill also makes provision, I believe, in improving the way in which we deal with some licensing provisions around alcohol, which I believe will help to support the licensing boards in making sure that we continue to make progress in tackling what is Scotland's unhealthy relationship with alcohol, something it costs this country each year some £3.6 billion in the social and health costs are associated with it. The other part around metal theft, we have all experienced the impact of metal theft, I have no doubt, within our own constituencies and the provisions within this bill, I believe, will make significant improvements in this area as well. And also on the issue of sexual entertainment venues, it has been very clear that the lack of sufficient legislation in order to license for sexual entertainment venues has not been, uh, been acceptable. And this provision, the provisions within this bill, will help to strengthen local authorities to make the decision based on local circumstances as to what they consider to be appropriate within their local area and to do that in a consultative and in a collaborative way with their local communities. Sign officer, this is a legislation which covers a number of different li licensing areas within Scotland. But it's a bill which passed today, I believe, delivers a significant improvement in improving public safety on air weapons, in improving public health and how we deal with alcohol licensing, and also in dealing with the scourge of metal theft. But equally, in also tackling violence against women that takes place within sexual entertainment venues and the legislation that we pass here this afternoon will help to deliver in all of these areas. And I believe that's something which will make sure that Scotland continues to be seen as a progressive place in dealing with these issues. Very nice. And that concludes the debate on the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of four Parliamentary Bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13634 and 13635 on approval of SSIs. Moved. Thank you. I would ask you to approve as well. Um, or to move, rather, 13636 on designation of a lead committee. Moved. Thank you. And motion number 13637 on committee membership. And moved. Many thanks. So the questions on these motions will be put at decision time, to which we now come, and there are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. And the first question is that motion 136. 06 in the name of Michael Matheson on the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division and members should cast their votes now. Result of the vote on motion number 13606 in the name of Michael Matheson is yes 92, no 17. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed and the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill is passed. The next question is that motion 13634 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. And the next question is that motion 13635 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you. Fourth question is that motion 13636 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on designation of a lead committee be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Many thanks. And the final question is that motion 13637 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on committee membership be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. And that concludes decision time. I now close this meeting of Parliament. Good recess. <laughs>